Would you ever let yourself become so wrapped up in hatred that you change your entire life to get revenge on someone? Well, that's exactly what I did, and it didn't exactly go to plan. I'm Clara, and I'm 25 years old. It all started five years ago when my boyfriend Jason went to study abroad in France. We were so in love at that time, and it wasn't easy being apart, but we coped surprisingly well. Jason even promised me we'd get married when he got back. But after a few short months of him being away, he started growing distant. He no longer called me every day, and he barely even replied to my texts. I thought maybe he was just too busy and stressful to deal with his new life while struggling with missing me. So I decided to do something wild and fly to Paris to surprise him on his upcoming birthday. I hadn't really thought about it, I just excitedly got on the flight and taken a taxi to his apartment. But, well, the moment I saw him walking into the lobby, I instantly regretted it. There Jason was, but he wasn't alone. He was hugging and kissing some other girl, and she even went upstairs with him. I felt my blood boil, and I wanted to scream, but instead, I just left. I was so upset, but I was also angry. How could he betray me like that? Going a long way just to see my boyfriend betraying me right in front of my eyes was a bad thing, and I didn't think life could get any worse. But I was wrong. Things were about to get much worse. After leaving his place, I booked myself into a nearby hostel and cried myself to sleep. The next moment, I was waking up to a burning smell. Oh God. The hostel was on fire! I was lucky to make it out of there alive, but I was badly burned and left with a huge scar on my face. There I was, heartbroken and burnt to a crisp in a foreign country where I knew no one and didn't speak the language. I'd never been so lonely and ugly in my life. As I looked in the mirror, all I felt was anger and resentment towards Jason. He destroyed my life, and at all costs, I would make him pay for it. After I'd recovered, I got on the plane and flew back to the USA. That's when I started plotting my revenge. I had a few things up my sleeve, but first things first. Plastic surgery. So, as soon as I graduated, I got myself a full face rework. I even changed my name, moved to a new apartment, and lived with a new identity. My life was miserable enough. So now all I wanted was to start all over again. And it worked. After the surgery, I turned into a completely different person. Just like I'd wanted. And what's more, I was even more beautiful than before the accident. I felt incredible and couldn't wait to start living again. Of course, I had to work my ass off to pay off my plastic surgery. But it was worth it, wasn't it? More than that, that was also how I tried my best to build a career for myself. Jason would regret cheating on me for the rest of his life, that's for sure. And as planned, after three years of working hard, I eventually got promoted to a management position in the construction company I worked for and became a beautiful, successful woman that many people admired. At the same time, a few of my friends mentioned that Jason had finally returned from Paris and was now working for a big architectural firm. I almost laughed when I heard the company's name. That was our new partner company. Oh, things were about to get fun. My friends also told me that he'd brought his French girlfriend back to the USA with him and that they were getting married soon. What? He was about to get married? They seemed so happy together, huh? No wonder that for all these years, he hadn't tried to contact me once. After I caught him cheating, I just disappeared. I could have been dead for all he knew. But he didn't seem to care. This made me hate him even more. There was no way a traitor could live happily like that. I couldn't wait any longer. It was time to put my plan into action. So I told my boss I'd work on the project with Jason's firm. At least this way, I'd have an excuse to approach him. At that first meeting, I made sure I looked as beautiful as possible and waited with bated breath. Of course, Jason didn't recognize me. And well, 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 would you believe it? He kept looking at me and flirting with me. 
I found it hilarious, and so kept flirting back, and eventually he got the hint and asked me out. What a jerk! Now I understood why I was abandoned in the past. Even when he already had his fiance, he could still flirt leisurely with others. His poor fiance! I kept playing along, and even made plans to befriend his fiance, Valerie. I knew she hung out in a certain cafe, so one day I went there and accidentally bumped into her, dropping water all over her gorgeous outfit. I kept apologizing and told her I'd pay to get it dry cleaned, and eventually we started chatting and hit it off. We exchanged numbers, and I asked if she'd like to go shopping sometime, which she agreed to. This was way too easy. A few days later, we went shopping, and it didn't take long before she started confiding in me about how lonely she was, and that other than her boyfriend, she didn't know anyone here. I smiled sweetly and told her I'd happily be her best friend. At the same time, Jason and I were dating. I pretended to fall for him, even though inside, I was furious at him. I even told him I'd share some confidential work documents with him if he pampered me and treated me like a princess. He seemed totally in love with me and spent all his spare time taking me out to dinner and buying me expensive gifts. It seemed like he was no longer interested in Valerie. Obviously, Valerie came to me and told me that she was very sad because the wedding was coming soon, but her fiancé was just cold and acting weird. On the one hand, I comforted and encouraged her, but on the other hand, I seduced Jason and took most of his money. He'd even put my name on the house contract, so technically, I owned his place. You know, I wanted Jason to feel the pain of being betrayed by the person he trusted. Then one day, Valerie called me in tears and said she suspected her boyfriend was seeing someone else. I asked her what her boyfriend's name was and where he worked, and said she didn't need to worry. I'd help her find out. A few days later, I sent Valerie a few photos of him cheating with me, but obviously, I hid my face. However, it was just enough evidence to make her suffer. Then I told Valerie that it looked like her boyfriend was working with this other girl on a project, and that Valerie could get her revenge by destroying the project. That way, he wouldn't be able to work with this other girl anymore. Valerie totally fell for it. It was insane! The very next day, I heard from my colleagues that Jason's crazy fiancé had destroyed the final layout for the design of the two companies' project. She spilled water on his laptop and threw it onto the ground. While the deadline was coming, it was too late to start it over. Apparently, Jason's boss was fuming and fired him immediately. This contract was worth millions of dollars, and he just ruined everything. I had to give it to Valerie. She didn't even think about it. That's how dumb she was. <laughs> Served Jason right. Finally, karma had come and bitten him in the ass. That evening, I went over to their house. Jason now has no job, no money, and he was about to lose his fiance and his house, too. I knocked on the door, and when Valerie opened it, she was shocked to see me, but not as shocked as she was about to become. Jason saw me and looked like he was going to pass out. Surprise! I said, Hi, Jason. At this, Valerie looked confused and said, Wait, do you two know each other? I just laughed and said, We sure do, Valerie. In fact, I'm the other woman who he is cheating on you with. And that's not all. I'm actually Jason's ex. Then I turned to Jason. That's right, Jason. It's me, Clara. Valerie, when he came to Paris, he was dating me and then he cheated on me with you, so I've been getting my sweet revenge. Both of them looked completely stunned, and instead of shouting at me, they started fighting with each other. Valerie was screaming. How could you? Jason shouted back. You're crazy! If you hadn't ruined my laptop, things wouldn't have been like this. Oh really? If you hadn't cheated on me, I wouldn't have done that! Valerie said, while bursting out crying. Pretty soon, she found out that the house belonged to me now, and all of his money, and that's when all hell broke loose. I just stood there, admiring how great my revenge had played out. Eventually, they broke up with each other, and I decided to kick them out of the house. So my cherished revenge plan for the past few years has been successful. 
However, there was just one problem. The price I paid for it wasn't small. When I showed up at work the next day, everyone was whispering about me, saying the project I'd been working on had been a complete failure and that it was all because I seduced the guy from our partner firm even when he was about to marry his fiance. It was a disaster. My reputation was ruined. I couldn't handle everyone being against me, so I resigned. I decided to spend some time at home for a while, trying to clear my head. I didn't get it. I'd spent years plotting my revenge, and now that it had finally been a success, why did I feel so bad? I'd been so caught up in ruining Jason's life. I hadn't thought how it would affect my life too. I'd been delusional. Above all, the joy and satiety of watching the two of them move out of the house was just temporary, and what remained after that was just a feeling of emptiness. What had I been doing? I was just ruining people's lives, especially with Valerie. She was so innocent in all of this. How could I have been so cruel? Then one day, as I was walking down the street, I saw her at the bus stop, and she looked so sad and thin, and it tormented me. That poor girl didn't deserve this. I couldn't just stand there and do nothing. I had to apologize, so I raced across the street. But by the time I got there, the bus had come, and she had gone. I decided to call her instead. I asked if we could talk, and at first, she refused. But once I said sorry, and told her how terrible I felt about everything, she agreed to meet me. I was holding the keys to her old house, and as she walked towards me, I handed them over. She was surprised, but then I started to explain. Valerie, I'm so sorry. I didn't want to hurt you. It's just that Jason broke my heart, and for years all I thought about was destroying his life the way he destroyed mine. I didn't realize you were so sweet, and now I see how awful I was to you. You don't deserve any of this. You trusted me, and I completely betrayed you. At first, Valerie didn't say anything. Then she started shouting at me, saying she thought of me as her best friend and that she felt so pathetic for trusting me. At this point, I burst into tears. I was a monster. The minute I started crying, something changed in Valerie. She hugged me. I couldn't believe it. After everything I'd done to her, she still wanted to hug me. We were there hugging and crying and, yep, Finally, something good had come out of all this mess. I had a friend, and very quickly, this friend will become my best friend for sure. You guys, honestly, I don't recommend wasting your time on revenge. I threw away so many years of my life obsessing over hurting Jason, and in the end, it just hurt me and poor innocent Valerie. From my own experience, I just want to tell you that always be the bigger person and live for yourself, not for others. Hey, my name's Kelly, and I'm so excited to start high school. Yes, I get it. Most kids my age feel the same way. But for them, it's all about proms, later curfews, getting their own car, and having a cute boyfriend or girlfriend. Okay, so those things sound great too. But the thing I'm most excited about is joining a cool club. A music one to be exact. You see, since I was little, I had this dream of being part of an awesome club like in Glee. Finally, school started. I was so eager to dive into this new environment. But it took me a few days till I could get a clue of where the music club office was or how to apply for it. No one seemed to know to be honest. Or maybe it's because I've only been asking freshmen who were just as lost as me. Anyway, after a lot of pacing the hallways, I found a room that said music club on the door. Well, it actually said M sick club, as the U was missing, but it had to be it, right? I couldn't contain my excitement. I took a deep breath and pushed the door open. Hello, everyone. I... What was this? I took one quick scan around the room, as there's not much to look at anyway. There was a rusty guitar in the corner, a dusty drum set, and some rackety old chairs. Three girls were sitting separately. One girl greeted me shyly, so I went and sat next to her. She said, Hi, I'm Daisy. I play guitar and sometimes the bass. I learn ballads, you know. Then this one girl who was painting her nails interrupted her. Ballads are the worst. She rolled her eyes. But luckily for you guys, I sing a mean pop tune. Daisy turned to me and whispered, 
That's Mia, and I'm not really sure if she can really sing, though. The only other girl in the room had her headphones in and was dancing weirdly. Daisy told me she was called Jill, and she could kind of play the drums. I looked around the room of misfits once again, and I'm not gonna lie. I was really disappointed. This wasn't what I imagined. I told myself it was okay, and that more kids might join up later on in the term. I mean, it wasn't the easiest club to find, so it might take some time. That's all. Besides, this was my chance to claim leadership here. So, without wasting any time, I gathered them all up for a little discussion. Then I started with introducing myself. Hey guys, I'm Kelly. I started play organ since 8. I've been trying to learn to compose songs too. There was not much reaction except for Daisy's shy claps. I then continued, So, we should have a team leader, right guys? Let's cast our votes. Everyone will have a minute to talk about why they should be the leader. Daisy nodded her head, Mia rolled her eyes and mouth, whatever, and Jill, well, she still had her headphones on, so I took the lead. Okay, so I'll start then. I think as the president of this club, I will... Mia cut my words. Fine, you're right, whatever. Who else votes for Kelsey? Hands up. I started saying, uh, my name is Kel... Mia raised her hand and then shook it out so her nails could dry. Jill raised her hand even though I don't think she actually knew what she was voting for. And Daisy raised hers while shyly adding, I think you'll be a great leader, Kelly. I'm too shy anyway, so you'll have my full support. Well, okay, that was easy, so I'm a club president now. That will look so good on my portfolio. <laughs> now, I will bring back this club from oblivion. We will revive it. I'll have my own high school musical. I was actually excited. As soon as I got home, I went through my song list and picked out some good ones. Then I texted the girls to bring their instruments in the following day. But then at practice, all my dreams came crashing down. Daisy was right. Mia's singing voice was terrible. But she couldn't play an instrument, so I had to let her take center stage, which she loved, as she clearly liked the spotlight. Light. But then Jill folded her arms and refused to play. She can't stand there. She's covering me entirely. The drum is the soul of the song. Duh. I should be center. This annoyed Mia and they started bickering. I left them to it and went over to Daisy. Please tell me you can sing, can you? We gotta do something. Mia couldn't be the only vocalist. We'll be doomed. Daisy looked stunned. She shook her head continuously. No, no, I can't do that. It's already such a big challenge for me to play in public. I can't sing. I tried convincing her that she could sing backing vocals with me, and she'd be fine. In the end, she agreed, but only if she could wear a mask on stage. What? Fine, I shouted. Fine. Guys, Daisy, it's okay. You can put a mask on while performing until whenever you feel comfortable. And you two, no need to fight. I'm sure the stage is big enough for you both to be in the spotlight. This is just a practice session. No one is here to see you. Just put up with it for a bit. Then when we're on stage, we'll figure it out. They all mellowed down a bit. Thankfully. Jeez, talk about draining. So. Over the next few weeks, we got to work and OMG, what a clash of personalities. I felt like I was the glue holding us all together and it was so exhausting. Mia wanted to practice in the morning, but Jill wanted to meet in the afternoon, so I suggested doing a morning one day and an afternoon the next practice day. Ugh. Then there was a song choice. Mia and Daisy were keen on a Taylor Swift song, but Jill tried to rock it up and made it sound awful. I compromised by letting her have a drum solo in the middle of it. They were hard work, but the strange thing is, I was actually beginning to like them all. Mia gave us all style tips and even let me borrow her lip gloss. Jill always recommended us some really interesting Netflix series to watch. Daisy made us homemade snacks to munch on during practice while I helped them out with their homework. Besides all the bickering, there were definitely friendships blossoming there. The problem is, our band sucked. We'd only performed twice during break time at the school basketball game, but no one even noticed us, not while the dance team was performing. They were so in sync, and this one kid could do the splits. I mean, how could we compete with that? Then finally, the prom came. This was our big shot. We prepared a lot and practiced hard for it. We even went picking out prom dresses together, thinking about how glorious we would all look on stage performing in these gorgeous dresses. Before our performance was the dance teams, so we couldn't set up our instruments beforehand since they said they would be in their way. So as soon as they finished, we had to rush on stage with our instruments. Trust me, this is not as easy as it sounds, especially when all of us, well, apart from Jill, were in long puffy dresses. 
Talking about Jill, she chose to wear this cape instead and it kept on getting tangled up and messing her rhythm. Daisy was distracted by the lights so she messed up all the notes and me, while I was playing, suddenly my keyboard stand collapsed. I guess due to being in a rush, it wasn't properly set up earlier. I had to improvise and immediately sat down to continue to play. And then Mia was too into it and sang off key while dancing which made her out of breath. It was a literal disaster. Seriously, it was so bad the baffled crowd gave a mixture of chuckles and amazed gasps. This is not how I envisioned it to go. Afterward, we walked in silence back to the music room to drop off our instruments. Then Jill said, I told you the prom dresses were a bad idea. Not only did you sound awful, but you look stupid too. Mia was fuming as she replied, says the girl in the stupid cape. Since when has the Count Dracula look ever been good? Jill said, at least I have talent. You're tone deaf. I am not. It's not my fault I have terrible backing singers. Yeah, right, Mia. Was that what you call singing? All you did was dance and scream. This ain't a nightclub. Mia fought back. My fault? What did I do? It's all because all you played so awful, so I had to try my best to stir up the crowd. And you, she turned to me, were you on stage to chill? Who on earth sits while performing? Me? Now you're blaming me? You were the one who set up the keyboard stand for me. It's because you didn't do it properly. Lucky for you, my keyboard is still okay. Never mind, guys. Let's not... Hey, you guys should have taken care of your own instruments. Don't blame me. Even if I sang off key, it was because you guys played terribly. Who chose this song? It was too hard for us. Okay. Let's stop blaming each other and focus on figuring out how to improve ourselves or else I doubt that the school will let us perform in any event ever again. Again? Isn't this enough to call it a day? This stupid club shouldn't even exist. I'm out of here. I quit. Me too. What a waste of time. Bye, losers. Ditto. Um, sorry, Kelly, but I can't do this anymore. I could only stand there and shout as they walked through the door. Guys, are you kidding me right now? Guys! Okay then, just leave. To hell with this club. My Glee club dreams were over. Yet I just stayed there wondering what I was meant to do now. This was the worst day ever. But it was okay. I joined another club. Maybe the dance club. I mean, I couldn't dance all that well, but I could learn, couldn't I? The Monday after, we all went to the club room to grab our stuff. The four of us didn't say a word to each other. It was super frosty. Then out of nowhere, this guy stepped in. Well, not just any guy. Cole Henderson, the hottest boy in freshman year. At first, I thought he was lost, but then he said, Hey guys, is this the room for music club? Hey, Kelly here. So, my dreams of being a part of an amazing school band, well, they weren't going so well. After a catastrophic prom performance, we all decided to go our separate ways. At least, it was until Cole, the hottest boy in freshman year, walked into the room. There he was, smiling in the doorway and holding his electric guitar. So, Joe glared at him and said, What do you want? He replied, Um... I know there isn't any member recruitment going right now, but I'd like to join the band if you guys... I was about to tell him that there was no band anymore, but Mia spoke first. Yes, sure, of course. Then she rushed over to him and dragged him across the room. Daisy looked puzzled and said, but weren't we already disbanded? Then Jill said, Daisy, you must have misheard us. We said we wanted to expand our brand, not disband. Is this for real? Wow, it's amazing what a cute guy can do. So I just nodded and then said, um, okay then, I guess. Welcome to the band. Okay, so think about it. This guy might not be in any way musically gifted. Not that it mattered. Because of him, there was currently still a band. And surely girls would come and see us now, even if we sucked. I mean, he's Cole Henderson. For Valentine's Day, he got at least 40 cards. They all fell out of his locker. It was crazy. So, we started practicing. And wow, it turned out Cole had an amazing voice. And he could play electric guitar like a pro. Mia even volunteered to step down and be backing vocals. What was going on? And Daisy was happy not to have to sing anymore and just concentrate on playing bass. 
having coal around solved a lot of our problems. The prom incident was completely forgotten. No more Mia and Jill fighting for the spotlight, but there was one thing. I knew they both had crushes on Cole. I mean, it was so obvious. Mia dressed up for every practice. I mean, she always makes an effort with her appearance, but glittery dresses on a normal school day? That was so over the top. Then there was Jill. Whenever Cole was around, she was so polite to everyone and complimented us on everything. I knew they were low-key competing with each other, as one time Jill's drumstick disappeared and while she was looking for them, Mia went over to Cole and felt his arm and asked him if he'd been working out. Then another time, Mia's lipstick was replaced with a black one, which she applied before practice. Horrified, she ran into the bathroom to wash it off and Jill went over to Cole and asked him to teach her how to play guitar while we waited for Mia. The band was certainly eventful, but I had to admit I was enjoying myself. We even decided on a name, Rouge September. This named after three of us have birthdays in September and Mia and Cole's favorite color is red, but Mia insisted on using the French word for it to be more edgy. Yep, it took us hours to come up with that, but I like it. I like it a lot. We really started to improve and had lots of fun doing it. Then Cole suggested we play One Direction's What Makes You Beautiful at this upcoming school concert. I loved the song, so I immediately agreed. Even Jill did, and I know she hates One Direction. So we rehearsed like crazy and everyone showed up on time and worked really hard. Yes, Mia and Jill's low-key competing continued, but whatever. At least we were all there practicing. The night of the performance arrived and I was mixed of excited and scared. Cole helped me set up my keyboard stand and I noticed that he kept on giving me funny looks. Before I could ask him what was up, it was time to perform. We were so amazing and everyone was cheering for us. Then the song ended and Cole started to talk into the microphone. Um, thanks guys. You were awesome. But um, there's something I want to say. Then he looked at me. Kelly... I just want to let the whole world know that you're the most beautiful girl and I really enjoyed getting to know you for the past few months and well, I'd love it if you could be my girlfriend. What was that? Was he out of his mind? Since when did he have feelings for me? The crowd went crazy, screaming and cheering while I froze there. I could see Jill and Mia were looking at me with fiery eyes. Cole tried to walk towards me and say something, but the microphone didn't work. Jill had just unplugged it and Mia charged towards me screaming, You traitor! Cole is mine! Cole jumped in front of me to protect me from her. Then Daisy suddenly burst into tears, like hysterically. We all looked at each other immediately knew, Oh boy, she must have had a crush on Cole too. The next thing we knew, a teacher walked on stage and shooed us off. That's when I noticed the whole crowd gapping at us and laughing. Jeez, this was so humiliating. Worse still, we walked off stage and the school director said, So, you think that was funny, do you? Let's see if you're still laughing in detention. Then he locked us all in a classroom and said we could only leave when we understood what we did wrong and resolved everything. There is no way I wanted to talk to any of them about this mess. Thanks to them, I look like a fool. And now I had detention while I hadn't even done anything. It was some five minutes of awkward silence until Cole shyly started. Okay, we can't just sit here in silence for however long. Look, I like Kelly and the concert was a great opportunity for me to confess my feelings. That's all. Was he serious right now? This was the last thing he needed to say right now. Jill suddenly fueled up again and turned to me yelling, You've been seducing Cole even though you knew I liked him? Cole tried to chime in. Guys, this is not how it works. Mia also came at me. You don't deserve to be our leader. You're so sneaky. Then there went Daisy, bursting out crying again. Jill tried to comfort her while Mia said, Another victim of beauty, huh? Daisy stuttered through tears. Why, why do you get everything? You got to be the leader. You got the cute boy. You get all the attention. Jill rolled her eyes. Yeah, so you're the lamest leader. So lame, my dog could do better. That was it. I'd had enough of these selfish people. I couldn't hold back anymore and screamed at them. Oh yeah? You think being a leader is easy? I guess you guys have never spared your precious seconds to think about how much I've done for you all. 
I got you a platform for the drum, a freaking mask, a dumb rhinestone microphone. You asked for it, I delivered it. It's all because I love this band. I want to have an actual band, a successful music club. I want to leave a legacy here at this school to make our high school years meaningful. But all I'm getting is hate and some selfish friends that I don't know if I could call friends anymore. I didn't know Cole liked me. In fact, I had no idea. I guess I was being too busy trying to keep this club together to notice. But no more. I'm done. I was out of breath after that. And when I finished, I saw them all looking at me stunned. Detention or no detention, I grabbed my stuff and I was about to leave when Mia timidly said, Um, sorry. I guess it's true. I really haven't thought. Jill added, yeah, you should have told us earlier. I'm sorry. I didn't know this really meant that much to you. Daisy wiped her tears. Yes, and please don't say that, Kelly. Of course. We're still friends. Please forgive us. Cole was about to say something too. Then Mia quickly covered his mouth. No, nah, no, nah, kid. This is our business. Now, Kelly, what do you say? Could you please take us back as your adorable friends and bandmates? Then, all three of them gathered up and looked at me with puppy eyes, trying to make me smile. I tried to keep my straight face, but eventually, I burst out laughing and hugged them all. Then Daisy cried again, which set all of us off. Even Jill! Cole was sitting there looking at us oddly. When Mia noticed this, she pointed at him and said, That boy was the one who broke us apart! Don't understand why we were so swooned over him! I wish I knew you were trouble when you walked in! Oh my god, did you just quote Taylor Swift? You know it's Taylor Swift, <laughs> Daisy laughed. But you're right, I'm so over him now. Yep, stupid crush, Jill agreed. I waved Cole over to join the group hug as I said, Guys, remember that Cole was the one who saved us when we were on the verge of disbandment. He deserves some credit. What do you mean on the verge? We were already disbanded, Mia joked. Then Jill added, Wow, we've been through it all. Now I guess we can get over everything together too, right guys? I said, yes, that's the spirit. Now on three, one, two, three, Rouge September, let's go. You thought this was the end to it? Nah, not quite. Later that day when I was walking back home, Cole ran after me. Hey Kelly, look, I'm sorry. I had no idea what this club meant to you. Please forget all about my confession and let's be friends. I want to help you with the ban and everything. I smiled at him. I'd like that. So, peace was restored and as for Rouge September, well, we're still going. Who knows? One day we might be the greatest band on earth. But yeah, having close friends, being together every day and playing music together is enough for me. But then, something weird started happening. I found myself smiling when I looked at Cole and noticing how cute he was when he tuned his guitar. Did I like, like him? No, it couldn't be, could it? I mean, if I did that then, that meant I had to confess to him this time around, right? But here's a thought, it surely won't be on stage. Hey guys, I'm Vanessa, and I want to tell you about my first love. So, do you all remember your first love? Yes, right? I mean, come on. How could you ever forget that first time butterflies in the tummy feeling, hand holding, and that kiss? In the heat of first love, it's easy to believe this will last forever and be a true fairy tale. Only so many first loves lead to a messy breakups that turn into a nightmare. My first love was with a boy named Julian, but you'll have to stick around to find out if our love story was a fairy tale dream or a fairy tale doom. Julian and I started off as friends, best friends. He lived across the street from me and our families were close. We hung out all the time, so much so that our parents teased that we'd get married one day. At the time I thought, no way, but we were just kids back then. Then, when I was about 10, I started to look at him differently. He was so cute and sweet, and I thought about him all the time. He liked me too, right? I mean, he bought me my favorite candy, let me play video games with him, and stuck up for me when these boys from school teased me. And then when I was 15, Julian and I were at our favorite spot. It was a really big old tree in the middle of the park. We went there loads and would lean against the tree trunk. 
do our homework, listen to music with one headphone, read books, basically anything relaxing. That's when he told me the shocking news. His dad had a new job in Germany and they were moving there. What? How could this be? I was so surprised, I started crying. I expected him to comfort me, but instead he took out a pocket knife and started to carve on the tree. When he finished, he said, Ta-da! How does it look? He'd carve J Hart V in it. Oh gosh, he loved me too. I felt myself turn bright red and didn't want him to see me like that. So looking downward, I went to punch his arm but punched his face by mistake. Oops! Julian held his face and yelled, Vanessa, what was that for? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Julian, I, I feel the same, I told him. We both started laughing, then we pinky promised each other that we would keep in touch. He took my hand and told me, Ness, I'll come back for you, I promise. Then he leaned in and kissed me. And, wow, it was truly magical. And then he left. The first few weeks without him were the hardest. I didn't really have any other friends and I was so bored and lonely. I lived for my video calls with Julian. They were the only thing keeping me going. Telling him stuff that happened at school, such as how my math teacher wore the same hideous floor dress all week, made me feel like he was still there. Things went on like that for a while. It slowly became a habit for us to have a video chat at least twice a week. But then a couple of days after my 16th birthday, things changed. It was a normal Sunday morning and I woke up and went to wash my face. Ah! There were red spots all over my cheeks! I screamed so loudly that I woke everybody up. Even my neighbors had to run over and ask what the scream was about. My parents took me to the hospital and I was diagnosed with a disease called lupus. For all of you who don't know what it is, it's a skin disease that causes rashes or sores. In my case, it was all over my cheeks. The same as what my grandma had. Worst of all, there was no cure. The doctors could only improve the way my skin looked, prevent scarring, and help me feel better overall. This couldn't be happening! Why me? When we got home, I ran right upstairs to my room and stared into the mirror. I'd gone from pretty to ugly in the space of a day. It wasn't fair! And then suddenly my phone rang. It was Julian. Oh no, in all the drama, I'd forgotten about our planned video call. I couldn't let him see me like this. I was so exhausted with all this lupus stuff that I couldn't think of a solution. So I just turned my phone off. I texted him the next day that I was busy so I couldn't FaceTime with him. This carried on for weeks. I just couldn't bring myself to tell him the truth. Then he texted me saying that he got the message loud and clear that I didn't want to be his friend anymore. I texted him back telling him this wasn't the case and I'd just been super busy. But the damage was done. He stopped calling me after that and even unfriended me on Facebook. And that was it. I lost my best friend and also my first love all because I couldn't cope with my new appearance. Little by little, I was shutting myself off and pushing everyone around me away. I just didn't want anyone to see me like this. Instead, I wanted to hide away from the world. Each day, I'd watch my classmates hang out together and I'd walk off by myself and go to my favorite tree, lean against the trunk, close my eyes, listen to some sad songs, and remember all the good times I had with Julian. This was basically part of my daily routine during the whole four years of high school. School finished and I moved away to college. Things got better. I made a few friends who accepted me for the way I looked and slowly, I started to accept it too. There was this one tree on campus. It looked just like the one back at home, so I went there all the time. One day, I was sitting there reading a book when this guy in a baseball cap started measuring the ground. Then, without looking at me, he said, Excuse me, can you please move? I was confused, so I asked, Um, sure, but why? The guy replied, Oh, the college is going to build a new cafeteria here, so we have to chop down this tree. What? They wanted to chop down my favorite spot on campus just so that they could build some stupid cafeteria? No way! Who was this guy anyway? And didn't anyone ever tell him it was rude not to look people in the eyes when talking to them? I gave him a piece of my mind. You architects are all the same. You never give a damn about what you have to destroy to build an ugly building. Leave this tree alone or I'll chop you down. 
Then I gave him a really dirty look. He just shrugged and carried on measuring. This made me so mad that I kicked him in the butt, causing him to fall onto the ground. His cap fell off and whoa, it couldn't be. Julian? Was that really him? But how? Wasn't he in Germany? Why was he here? And why didn't he recognize me? I mean, I had a different haircut and all, but I didn't think I've changed that much. Or was it because of my lupus? Suddenly, I heard him say, What the? Are you mad? What's wrong with you? Oh gosh, I'd totally forgotten that he was still lying on the ground. I mumbled out a, Sorry, and immediately rushed back to my dorm. That night, I couldn't sleep. Instead, all I could think about was Julian. He was so handsome and so tall. How could he have become so good looking? Ah, why did this stupid disease pick me? There was my first love right in front of me after all those years apart. But because of my disease, he didn't know who I was. He blossomed and I'd well, I hadn't. Maybe it was for the better that Julian didn't recognize me. If he knew this was how I look like now, oh boy, I didn't even want to imagine how embarrassed I would be. So, okay, let's just put it aside for now. What I first needed to do was save my tree. There's no way I was letting the college chop it down. I did some research and found out that the construction would begin in a week. So, I had time to convince as many students as I could to protest against it. And when the day came, I had about 20 people with me. We all held signs and said, save the tree and stop the chop. The head of campus, Julian, and the construction workers were trying to make us leave, but we were persistent. At the end, they had to push back the construction dates. One of us remained by the tree at all times, come rain or shine. It was exhausting and cold, but it was worth it when the tree was saved. Then, one day when I was on tree guarding duty, my friend rushed over to me and excitedly told me that the college was going to change the location of the new building. That was such great news. Apparently, Juliana had told them that the ground was more suitable in another location. Why would he help us all of a sudden? Did he have a change of mind? I went to class with those questions that kept bugging my mind. And right after school was out, I came over to the tree again. And to my surprise, I saw Julian standing next to it. I walked towards him and asked, Why did you convince them to change the location of the building? I mean, we really appreciate it, but why the change of heart? Julian froze for a second and then said, Hey, it's Vanessa, back with the final part of my story. So, my first love Julian moved to Germany and due to my insecurities, we lost touch. Then, years later, I saw him at my college campus, measuring my favorite tree to be chopped down. He didn't recognize me, but thanks to him, the tree was saved. He said to me, This tree must mean a lot to you, or else you wouldn't have fought so hard to save it. I had a tree like this once, he sighed. Please continue to protect it. I felt a pain in my heart. I knew he meant our tree back home. This was all so overwhelming. There I was looking at my first love, but he was oblivious to who I was. And I couldn't tell him because I was terrified that doing so would mean I'd lose him all over again. After that, I didn't see him around campus anymore. Was he living here now? Was he in another city? There were so many questions I wanted to ask him. Then my mom called and told me to come home for the weekend. I arrived there to find her setting out food in the kitchen. On seeing me, she said, Oh honey, I have a surprise for you. Julian and his family are back in town and they're coming over for lunch. What? Oh no. Why hadn't she told me sooner? I started to panic. What was I going to do now? I rushed to my room and tried to find anything I could use to cover my face. Finally, I found one thing. I heard my mom opening the door for Julian and his family. Then my mom cheerfully shouted, Vanessa! Where are you, sweetie? Come down! Julian is here and oh my, he's so handsome. But my parents' smile soon disappeared as soon as they saw me coming down the stairs. They literally stood there with their mouths wide open. My mother stuttered, v Vanessa, what in God's name are you wearing? Yeah, so the only thing I could find to cover my face was a face 
mask. Worse still, it had a smiling dog face on it. I know I look ridiculous, but at least my lupus was covered. Thinking fast, I muttered, Um, I have a cold and I don't want anyone to catch it. Then I turned and saw Julian and my heart fluttered. He gave me a confused look. He clearly didn't know how to take my accessory. This was so awkward. The last memory he had of me was that I didn't want to video call with him anymore. And that was five years ago. Ugh, this sucked. I nodded at him and he nodded back. I caught him looking at me, no doubt because I was wearing that dumb mask. But we didn't actually speak to each other. Luckily, our parents were carrying the conversation. But then, my mom suggested that we should all go out for dinner tomorrow night. Mom! Not again! Why didn't she realize that I needed to be pre-warned about these things? Then again, it was so easy for her as she had perfect looking skin. Luckily, Julian's family were busy tomorrow. Phew! But they suggested having dinner the day after that. Ugh! Dinner was unavoidable, so I had to figure out a way of disguising my face. So, the evening of the dinner, I ran downstairs and my mom glared at me. Vanessa, what on earth are you wearing? You look like Elton John. So yeah, I was wearing these huge fashion sunglasses. They were the only ones I could find online that I knew would arrive in time. I replied, this is the new trend now. You're just too old to understand. At the restaurant, Julian and his family gave me the weirdest looks. But I acted like everything was normal and mentioned how good the food was. To be honest, I felt so awkward and just hoped this meal would be over soon. It all got a bit too much, so I went outside to get some fresh air. That's when Julian appeared. At first, he just stood there next to me in silence. It got to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. So I said, since when did you come back here? He replied, since one month. Feeling annoyed, I replied, why didn't you call me? Ness. You're the one who didn't want to be friends anymore. Oh no, you got it all wrong. I had some problems, girl problems. I couldn't tell you. You know, I was really lonely in Germany. You were the only friend I had. His voice sagged. I replied, I know, it was stupid of me. I'm sorry, but you're back now. Can we be friends again? He looked at me for a bit, then smiled and said, Seriously, how can I be mad at you now? I mean, look at you. And then we hugged. I finally had my best friend back, but this wasn't enough for me. Seeing him again made me realize I still loved him even after all these years. My face was the problem. I was convinced that on seeing the real me, he'd run for the hills. After that, Julian and I texted each other loads, but then he asked me out on a date. At first, I was super excited, but then the reality of this dawned on me. I put on my prettiest dress, but as I stood in front of the mirror, all I saw were my bright red cheeks. Maybe I should just risk it. Maybe he would understand and still love me? I mean, it was inner beauty that counted, right? But no, I couldn't do it. So, I messaged him back, saying that I couldn't go out with him. But he was persistent. In the end, I ran out of excuses, so eventually, I had to agree. Okay, so now what? I couldn't keep on wearing face masks and sunglasses. Then I had an idea. What about makeup? I knew it would make my skin worse, but this was an emergency. I put some makeup on, but the rashes were still visible. So I put more and more and more and ugh. I resembled Billy the Puppet from the Saw movies. Then there was a knock at the door. <gasps> oh no, he was here already. Oh well, I hope he likes horror movies. On seeing me, Julian looked kind of shocked, but he tried to act normal. The restaurant we went to was so nice, but every time he looked at me, he had to try his hardest not to laugh, which in turn made me want to laugh too. Awkward. Afterward, we went for a walk through the park when it suddenly began to rain. So we hurried over to our favorite big tree to take cover. Julian found the carving on the tree and said, Do you remember this? That day I promised you I'd come back for you. Then he turned to me, pulled me towards him, his face came closer and, and oh my god, was he going to kiss me? But then he stopped and said, oh Ness, your makeup is floating away. I have a tissue, let me clean your face. Wait, what? 
Oh no, not now. I panicked. I didn't know what to do, so I hid my face from Julian and said, Don't look at me. Can you please go? Confused, he asked, What? You're acting really weird. What's wrong? Then he turned to look at my face. I pushed him away and said, No, no, I'm fine. I'm just having a girl problem moment. But Julian kept insisting, so I freaked out and ran into the rain. He ran behind me yelling, Vanessa, stop! I kept running, but then I tripped and my face fell into a muddy puddle. Oh, great! My whole face was covered with mud and my knee was bleeding, so I couldn't stand up. Julian had to help me hobble to the nearest drugstore to buy some bandages and some betadine to clean the wound for me. I sat on a bench feeling like a wounded puppy when he took out a tissue and started wiping the mud from my face. At first, I stopped him, but then he gave me a really serious look, so I let him clean my face. Well, that was it. Julian would finally see my face and he would definitely not want to date me anymore. While cleaning my face, he looked surprised. Then he said, Wait a minute, you're going to college in Florida, right? Didn't I meet you like a few weeks ago on the campus? Why didn't you tell me it was you? Because I didn't want you to see me like this. I turned my head away. He looked confused, so he asked, Like what exactly? Ness, you're acting so weird. What did he mean? Was he trying to make fun of me? So I shouted in anger, it's my face. Don't act like you don't see it. I was afraid that if you saw my face, you wouldn't want to be with me anymore. Julian shook his head and said, no, Ness, why would I ever do that? To me, you will always be beautiful. Beauty isn't only about having a pretty face. It's about having a pretty mind, a pretty heart, and a pretty soul. And then he kissed me on the forehead. Oh gosh, I never imagined that it would turn out like this. Julian was indeed the sweetest person ever, and I should have never have doubted him. Well, Julian and I became an official couple. Loving him makes me so happy. He makes me believe in myself and reminds me that regardless of my lupus, I'm still beautiful. And we will soon get married in a few months. I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with him happily ever after. So, as you can see, in the end, Julian was my first and my last love, which means my fairy tale dreams did come true. But let me tell you this, it's not important if you marry your first love or not. It's important that you marry someone who makes you happy and someone who accepts you for who you are. So, when you find someone like that, then hold on to them, whether this is your first or your 21st love. Hey, it's Jessica. From the outside, my life seemed perfect. My family is wealthy, I'm beautiful, shining bright, and even my job is fancy. But from the inside, I do have a character flaw. It's my short temper that almost caused me to lose everything. I've always been daddy's little princess, which means that anything I want, I have to get, such as new clothes, a new car, and exotic vacations. Because of this, other girls have always been jealous of me. But Kath was different. She realized there's so much more to me than my designer outfits and glossy hair. Kathy's family lived nearby. You see, my dad was friends with Kath's father, who passed away when she was little. But being the nice guy my dad is, he continued to support them. He paid for Kath's education, so we went to the same school. She was the only friend who could handle my short temper. I know, that wasn't nice but it was hard dealing with the average girl's jealousy toward me. As a result, there were a few incidents. One time, when I was just a primary student, some girl dared to put on my shirt after sports. She said it was an accident, but as if. I yelled at her that she'd stretched it, and now she owed me a new one. Kath tried to defuse the situation, but she just got caught up in the middle of the shouting match. Literally. As me and this girl were screaming insults at each other across Kath. Then another time, some kids sat in my seat in the canteen, and when I asked them to move, they refused to. I was fuming, so I poured my custard all over them. Seeing as the kids were about to get crazy, Kath passed them a napkin, hurriedly apologized to them, then led me out of there before I covered them in more of my lunch. She understood how mad I got on things, but never got annoyed at me about it. This is why our friendship continued into adulthood. It was perfect to have a friend like Kath to grow up with, but what made my life even more perfect was the arrival of our boy next door. 
Yes! A new family had just moved in, and my mom told me that a cute boy my age was going around meeting people. I ran out to suss it out and find Kath standing on her front porch and talking to a super cute guy. I swished out my hair and tottered over to them. Hi, Kath! I smiled at her. Then I turned to him and said, Hi there! We definitely haven't met before, because there's no way I'd forget you. He smiled back and introduced himself as Andrew and said he lived on that block. I sat down on the couch in Kath's house and did my research on Andrew and found out he was a pretty famous influencer. His dad ran off with another woman and started a new family, so Andrew lives with his mom and Nan. And best of all, he was single. I pulled on Kath's arm and insisted that she help me beg Andrew as my man. She looked a little awkward at first, but then she reluctantly agreed to help. I persuaded Kath to pretend that she lost her phone, then I went round to Andrew's and begged him to come and help us look for it. He spent the whole afternoon trying to help us look for it, only to hear it buzzing in my pocket. Oops. Then one time, well, this wasn't planned, but I managed to get one of my new heels stuck in a drain cover. I was standing there yelling at it when Andrew walked past and told me to take my shoe off. I refused. Did he have any idea how expensive they were? He just laughed and told me to lean on him while he carefully unwedged my shoe. Whose heart wouldn't melt for this gentle guy? After that, we started to talk more, and then chatted every day. He had a sense of humor and was very gentle toward me. It is so wonderful to know that he was impressed by how cute I was, hiding Kat's phone in my pocket to find a chance to make friends. How embarrassing, but seemed like he liked that. After two months, he asked me out on a date, and soon we became an official couple. I loved being around his family, as his mom and grandma were so sweet and friendly. Then my dad said he needed me to go on a three-month business trip in San Diego. I didn't want to leave Andrew for so long, but there was nothing I could do about it. Ugh, being an adult sucked sometimes. I just had to pack up and take a flight to San Diego, then finish the job as quickly as possible. Little did I know how terrible things could happen in the next three months. One night, my mom called me up. She was furious, and at first, I couldn't work out what she was saying. Finally, she calmed down enough for me to make her words out. Jess, I found the DNA test hidden away in one of your father's filing cabinets. Kath is his biological daughter. This whole time, he's been lying to us. I cannot put up with this. I'm divorcing him, and I won't be happy until he's left with nothing. What? Kath was my sister? No, it couldn't be. I called up Kath to get to the bottom of this. As soon as she picked up, I screamed at her. Your dad's my dad. How could you keep this a secret? You're trash, and so's your mom. You're both vile, ugly gold diggers, and I hate you both. Kath spluttered out. Wh what Huh? I don't understand. You heard me. You're trash, and so's your mom. She's nothing more than a man-eating, money-obsessed liar, and I hate her. Sobbing, Kath replied, Don't talk about my mom like that. This only made me angrier, so I yelled, I will say what I want to. I hate you, and I hate her. I hope you both fall down a pothole and never get out. Suddenly, I heard a voice say in the background, Who are you talking to? And why are you so upset? I knew that voice. It was Andrew's. Why was he with Kath? I was about to scream out at her to stay away from my man, but she hung up. I immediately tried calling Andrew, but he didn't answer. I was so angry, I screamed out, then went into the kitchen and started smashing glasses onto the floor and swiping things out of the cupboards. The next day, Andrew called me. I thought he was going to try and worm his way out of what he did, so I answered with a, Oh, hi, Andrew. It's nice to finally hear from you. He replied, Um, hi, Jess. Look, I have something important to tell you. Um, it's my grandma. She's in the hospital, and I can't afford the medical bills. I hate asking, but please, could I borrow some money? Furious, I yelled, Who do you think you are? You did the dirty behind my back, 
and now you have the cheek to ask for my help? It's none of my business, dude. He fell silent, then hung up. At first, I was fuming. How dare he do that to me? But once I had time to calm down, I thought maybe I had overreacted a tiny bit. I mean, I could have given him a chance to explain, so I tried calling him again, but he didn't answer. I called Kath, and in my calmest voice, I asked her to tell me what was going on. She said she had no idea that my dad was also her real dad, and it was a lot for her to process. Then she said that she was only around at Andrew's last night because his grandma had a fever, and she was trying to help. But then her fever worsened, so she was taken to the hospital. I felt pretty bad about it all, so I tried calling Andrew again to sort all this mess out. But he'd blocked my number. I transferred him some money over towards his grandma's expenses, but he sent it straight back to me. Ugh. <sighs> it was so hard being so far away from Andrew and not being able to go and talk things through with him. I missed him like crazy. Because of this, I confided in Kath loads, and she kept me in the loop about how Andrew's grandma was. Apparently, she wasn't well at all. Then, one day, she came up with an idea to help. She told me to send money to her account, and she'd give it to Andrew, and tell him it was from her. Then, when his grandma was better, she'd tell Andrew the truth about where the money came from, and he was sure to realize how much I cared for him and forgive me. I thought this was a great idea, so I sent Kath the money. Then things got weird. She went super quiet and then stopped talking to me altogether. Then two months later, through social media, I found out that Andrew was getting married. To Kath! What? After having a screaming frenzy, I calmed down enough to book a flight home. I took an Uber to Andrew's house and pounded on his door. He answered, and on seeing me, he slammed the door in my face. I wasn't leaving until he spoke to me, so I sat on his doorstep. It was only when it started to rain that he eventually opened the door, and in a gruff tone said, Okay, you have two minutes. Then I want you off my property for good. Look, I know you're mad, and I'm sorry, but why are you ignoring me? I tried to make amends for what I did. I sent you the money. I know. I sent it straight back, remember? He grunted. Not that money. The money that Kath gave to you and said was from me. What? That money was from her, not you. You're jealous. You found out I was marrying her, and you're here to ruin our lives. No, no, I'm not. Please, it was me. I wanted to help. I pleaded, but he tutted, then slammed the door again. I stood there, a soggy mess, and his words sunk in. Kath had lied to Andrew about the money. Why would she do that? Furious, I stormed around to her house and was about to press the buzzer down until she answered when the door opened, and I saw Kath stepping out with Andrew's mom. I jumped out of sight and listened. Andrew's mom was thanking her for all her help and saying how much she couldn't wait for her to be her daughter-in-law. What? As soon as his mom walked off, I jumped out of hiding and confronted Kath. You're a liar! Kath was surprised seeing me, but then she just shrugged and said, Whatever, then walked toward her door. He's my man now, not yours, she added, looking back at me. You traitor! I screamed at her as I charged towards her. We got into a fight, and there was a lot of hair pulling. Finally, Kath managed to get through her entrance door and lock me out. She grinned at me through the window, so I shouted at her. Kath, you just wait. You won't get away with this. A few days passed, and their wedding day arrived. It was in some super swanky golf resort. I tried sneaking in through the entrance, but two guards stopped me. Ugh, Kath must have pre-warned them about me. So I had to find another way in, which involved climbing through a tiny gap in the hedge. A bodycon dress wasn't my best choice, and I had twigs in my hair and grass stains all over me. Still, out of breath, I showed up at the aisle and waved the evidence of bank statements and messages between me and Kath in Andrew's face, and shouted, Look, this is all the proof you need to show that I sent the money to Kath to help your grandma, and she's a filthy liar! Andrew looked shocked, but he took the evidence from me. No, she's making it up! Kath's eyes widened in alarm, 
as she tried to grab the evidence out of Andrew's hands. Seeing her reaction, he pulled it away from her and looked through it, his face falling when he discovered the truth. How could you lie to me about this? He stared at her. You told me that Jess cut all contact with you. Teary-eyed, Kath glared at me and said, You get everything! The nice clothes and the lavish lifestyle, yet you act like a spoiled brat! I was sick of hiding in your shadow and defending you for all your childish outbursts! I liked Andrew from the beginning, but no, you had to have him! Through gritted teeth, Andrew told her, It's over, Kath. I never want to see you ever again! After that, she rushed up the aisle in a frenzy of white fabric and sobs. Jeez, talk about making an exit! That was three months ago, and a lot has changed since then. My dad eventually managed to persuade Mum to forgive him, although he had to buy her a new car and take her on a month-long island getaway. Also, she insisted that she never wanted to see Kath or her mom ever again, so Dad arranged for them to move to another city. This worked for me, as I never wanted to see Kath again either. I know I have a short temper, and I overreact sometimes, but I honestly believed that Kath was my friend. It hurt knowing that she didn't care about me at all. She just wanted my life. As for Andrew and me, now we're back together. And there's no way I'm letting my short temper cause me to lose him again. All of this could have been avoided if I hadn't let my anger blindside me. I should have trusted him from the start and heard him out. So now, if I feel anger overtaking my thoughts, I will go and pace the yard first to calm down. I may look like a crazy person, but it works a treat. Hi, my name is Happiness. You're impressed with my name, right? My dad gave me that name, and yeah, as you can guess, he put a lot of hopes and dreams in me. I'm now 18 years old, and tomorrow I will fly to Massachusetts to start my college. My parents are preparing a farewell party for me downstairs. I have never left my hometown and been away from my family, so this is such an occasion. As I'm packing my belongings for college, a flood of memories come to mind. You see, when I was a kid, my family was dirt poor. We lived in an old, dilapidated house on the outskirts of Selma in Alabama. I remember we would buy a chicken at the beginning of the month, and my parents would make it last the whole month. I didn't realize we were poor, though. In fact, at that point, I was just a happy, carefree little girl, but that wouldn't last. My mom worked as a cleaner for a rich family, but they treated her terribly, and she barely earned enough money to even take the bus there. My dad was a lorry driver. And so he was away a lot, delivering goods to other states. Every weekend when he came home, I'd stand out on the porch as soon as I saw his big truck driving out the dusty road. I'd run out there and jump up and down. The best part was that he always brought me a little present, like a piece of candy that he'd save for me, or a small toy. They weren't valuable gifts, but they meant the world to me. One time he came home, and I ran up to him and said, Daddy, yesterday Jeannie's dad brought her a chocolate egg back from his trip. It even had a toy inside. I want one too. My dad looked confused. Then he said he'd heard of them, and they were called Kinder Eggs. And then, with loving eyes and a smile, he promised he'd find me one, no matter how hard it would be, even if it was the last thing he did. The next weekend, I raced out to the street and could barely contain my excitement as I waited for him to come home. I waited and waited but still he didn't arrive. I started to get worried, so I asked my mom where he was. She said, oh, sweetie, he's on his way. Why don't you go to sleep, and as soon as you wake up, he'll be here. There was no way I could sleep. All I could think about was getting a chocolate egg with a toy inside. I'd almost dozed off when I heard his voice. I ran downstairs and jumped into his arms, hugging him. I missed you, daddy, I told him, and he laughed and said, I missed you too, sweetie pie. Then I said, um, where is it? Did you get me a chocolate egg? I eagerly asked. Then his face dropped. He said, Sorry, baby. I was working late, so I didn't have time to buy one. But I promise I'll bring you two next time to make up for it. Okay? But this wasn't okay. I was so disappointed. I pushed him away from me and burst into tears, saying, You promised! You promised me! I had never cried like that before over something so small. At the time, it felt like such a big deal. 
and my dad looked confused to see me so upset. At that moment, my mom came through and saw me. She immediately understood everything, then started to comfort my dad. Come on, honey, take a rest. You've worked yourself too hard recently. Come eat, you're so skinny these days. This just made me more annoyed. I was the one who needed comforting, not my dad. So I shouted at my mom, Mommy, daddy didn't keep his promise. But my mom just ignored me, and so I stormed back up the stairs, crying all the way. After I'd calmed down, my mom came to my room and said, Happiness, your dad works so hard, and you should just be happy that he's home safely. I know he didn't bring you what you wanted, but he will next time, okay? In the meantime, I'll make your favorite cupcakes every day. Every day? Wow, okay, I said to her. And she really did. She made me cupcakes every day, and I was so happy. After a few days, I said to her, Mommy, I like you more than Daddy. I don't even love him anymore because he broke his promise. My mom just looked at me and said, Oh, happiness, you don't know what you're saying. One day when you grow up, you'll understand that everything your dad does is for you. He loves you so much. The next weekend rolled around, and as usual, I ran outside to wait for my dad. Just like the week before, the sun set and still he was nowhere to be seen. I was about to start crying when I noticed a man running towards our front door. My mom appeared and he said something, and suddenly my mom started panicking. She called out to me and said we had to go to grandpa's place immediately. I had no idea what was happening, but for the next month, my grandpa took care of me because my parents didn't come home. I missed them so much, and whenever I asked when they were coming to get me, my grandpa just said, Happiness, they're busy working. Don't you worry, just stay here and enjoy your time with me. Eventually, I got used to it. Then one morning, Grandpa woke me up early and said it was time to go home. I was so excited that I kept on singing happily. As we pulled up outside our house, my heart started beating faster. I was home! Then a shadow appeared in the doorway, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was my mom and dad. But my dad was in a wheelchair. My mom looked so thin and tired, and my dad had no legs. What had happened? I looked to Grandpa to reassure me, but he looked as nervous as I did. Then in my little voice, I said, Daddy, where are your legs? He smiled at me and with his usual loving eye said, They got hurt. But hey, what do you think of my wheelchair? He let me sit on his lap and Mom pushed us around and it was so cool. I was way too young to understand what was really going on. All I remember was how many people kept visiting to check on Dad and that I finally got to try a chocolate egg. That same day, a doctor came to visit, and after he checked on my dad, he came over and patted my head. Then he pulled a chocolate egg out of his bag, and then another one, and another one! Three chocolate eggs! I couldn't believe it. I was shaking with excitement. The doctor said the gift was from my dad, and that I should thank him. I ran to my dad and said, Thank you, Daddy. He looked like he was going to cry, and I asked if he was okay, and he just smiled and said, I'm happy because you're happy. That's all that matters to me. For the first time in my life, I got to try a chocolate egg, and it was the most delicious thing I'd ever tasted. And the best part was that inside there was a toy. After I opened and ate all three, I just wanted more. I kept asking my dad when I could get more, and he just laughed. And then I thought, maybe if I studied really hard and was a good girl, I'd get some more. So that's what I did. I focused on my study. And one day I won a medal at school for winning a math contest. I was so excited to show my parents and assumed they'd give me a chocolate egg as a reward. But that's not what happened. They congratulated me, but said it wasn't possible for them to get me another chocolate egg. I don't know why, but this made me so angry. I cried and I even threw my bag at them. And this made my mom super mad. She scolded me so much that I was scared and ran out the house and went to my grandpa's house. I cried and cried and told him everything. And my grandpa said, Happiness, the reason your mom got so mad is because she is under too much pressure and has to work so hard to look after you. Now, your dad can't work, so she's in charge. And it's a lot for her to deal with. Then he told me what happened to my dad and it changed my life forever. That day when my dad was out doing his deliveries, 
he got an opportunity to do some overtime, which he jumped at the chance to do so he could buy me my chocolate eggs. On his way home, he stopped to buy them for me. And then because he was so tired, as he was leaving the store, he got hit by a drunk driver. He was hit so hard he lost both his legs. I couldn't believe it. How could I have been so selfish? If it weren't for me demanding a chocolate egg, my dad would still have his legs. I felt so terrible. And so the next day, when I won some candy for the other math contests, I came home and went to my parents. Mommy, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I want you to have these. You always do your best to give me the sweetest life, and so I wanted to make yours sweeter too. That probably sounds a bit deep for a six-year-old to say, right? Well, my grandpa taught me that one. My parents were so moved that they almost cried when they hugged me. And even though I didn't understand it at the time, I do now. And it's so true. It's taken me a while, but now that I'm about to move out, I finally understand the life my parents have given me and how sweet it has been. Through this channel, I'd like to send some words to my parents. Mom, Dad, if you're watching this, I want you to know how much I appreciate everything you've done for me. Now it's my turn to work hard and make you proud. No matter how hard life gets, I'll persevere, just like you both have, because I'm your happiness. Do you believe in fate? Well, I never did. I'm a 21-year-old college student studying finance and banking. So, yeah, numbers are my forte. Therefore, I'm a logical thinker. Horoscopes and chance meetings? As if. But then I met someone who changed it all. I'm Kai, by the way, and let me tell you my story. It all started one evening while studying. I got a serious craving for some Cheetos, so I went out to get some. That's when I saw a petite girl shouting at two huge guys in the park. Hey, Bigfoot, did you really just litter? Pick it up now or I'll give you a good going over. Oh man, did this girl have a death wish? And was she drunk? The two guys didn't look happy. They approached her and one of them even raised his hand up like he was going to hit her. But she quickly pushed his hand away, which only made him matter. Man, I didn't want to get involved in this. So I pretended I hadn't seen them and walked off. But then I was just a few steps away, I heard one of the guys scream, and the other guy said, What the? Gross! I could have just carried on walking, but nope, my curiosity got the better of me. So I turned around and saw that one guy was covered in vomit. Then the girl pointed at me and said, Honey, there you are! Then she fainted. Huh? I didn't know her. I was staring at them, looking perplexed, when one of the dudes yelled, Why are you still standing there? Quickly take your crazy girlfriend home if you don't want to taste my fist. I was so scared, I hurried over and carried this girl off. I had no idea who she was or where she lived. Um, this was crazy. I placed her down on a nearby bench and looked around for those guys, but luckily, they'd gone. I didn't know what to do, so I left her there and walked off. But then I started to feel bad. Was I too heartless? What if something else happened to her? So I went back and gave the girl a piggyback ride back to my house. Jeez, she was so much heavier than she looked. As soon as I dropped her onto the couch, her phone rang, so I answered it. Hello? Then the person on the other end of the line asked, Who are you? Where's my friend? I muttered out my address and was about to tell her to come pick up her friend, but she already hung up. Why was she so rude? I'd almost bust my back carrying her friend to safety. How annoying! This night has been far too dramatic for me, and worse still, I didn't have any Cheetos. I decided to take a shower, then get some sleep. But as soon as I stepped out of the bathroom, the doorbell rang. I presumed it must be the girl's friend, so I answered the door. Then two cops immediately pushed me against the wall and handcuffed me. Before I could fathom what was happening, one of them said kidnap and assault accusations had been made against me, and I was escorted to the station. What? I tried to explain what happened, but they wouldn't listen to me. That night, as I sat in the cold, uninviting cell, I found myself regretting my kindness. I didn't sleep a wink. I just hoped the next morning came quickly, so that I could confront that girl about this false accusation. But before I could do that, the cops released me at dawn. The girl had sobered up, and told them it was all just a misunderstanding. Well, luckily, she still remembered a bit, or else, ugh, I didn't dare to imagine it anymore. I swore I would never get involved with anyone in need ever again. No good deed goes unpunished, for real.
A few days later, when I was watching TV, someone knocked on my door. And you wouldn't believe it. It's the drunk girl. I looked at her suspiciously. What are you doing here? The girl didn't say anything. Instead, she coldly slipped past me and entered my house. Huh? What was she playing at? Then she glared at me and asked me about that night. After I told her everything that happened, she laughed. Okay, I believe you. If I didn't, you'd know about it. She held her fist in front of me. I startled and almost fell off my chair. Then she chuckled. Now I'm hungry. Go make your guests some food. What was with this girl? She was so direct and bold. I glanced at her and said no, but she continued. If you don't, I'll go to the cops and change my statement. Then she got up to leave, so I quickly said, okay, okay, fine. Then reluctantly searched my cupboards for food. Ah, trusted spaghetti, how you never fail me. So I prepared Balinese for us. While she was eating, she said, I'm Nora, by the way, the best screenplay writer major in the country. She winked. She thanked me for the food, then left. Phew, that'd be it now, surely. Nope, turns out this was just the beginning. The next morning, she texted me. Come pick me up for college ASAP, else I'm calling the cops. Was she being serious? Then she sent me another message with her address and told me to hurry up. I rushed over there and she got into my car, glared at me, and said, You're late. And that's how I somehow became this Nora girl's servant. Her calls and messages could come at any time. And she would always force me to do things for her straight away. One time I was soaking in the bath when she texted and demanded I bring her some chocolate. Another time she called me at 2 a.m. and told me she was bored, so I had to come over and play some video games with her. I also became her unpaid Uber driver. Every day, from home to school and back. And it's inevitable that I overslept once, so Nora bombarded my phone with tons of texts and calls. I groggily answered, and she used her calling the cops threat again to force me to get there in 15 minutes. What a pain in the neck. Another time, I just stepped out of the house to go and hang out with my friends when Nora showed up and insisted that I had to take her to the cinema. She wouldn't take no for an answer, so I had to cancel on my friends and go watch some bland movie with her. Such a troublesome girl, right? But strangely, as time went by, I started to find Nora less annoying, and instead found myself smiling when she texted me or called. On the days when she didn't bother me, well, my mood seemed to dampen. Was I crazy? I mean, she was cute, very spontaneous, and, well, there was no one else quite like her. But then, all of a sudden, the messages and calls stopped. Did she not want me around anymore? I miss Nora. Many times I had to stop myself from calling her. I should be happy I was out of Nora's control, right? Then one day out of the blue, my phone beeped. It was Nora. Come to the Starbucks on Vincent Street. Move it. You have five minutes. Jeez, that bossy tone again. Still, I immediately drove to the address. When I got there, I saw Nora with a guy and a girl. I walked over to them and just sat down. Nora held my arm. Honey, why are you so late? I stared at her in surprise. She smiled and turned to the other two. This is Kai, my boyfriend. What? Did I get it wrong? Did she just say I was her boyfriend? Then she said, Kai, this is my former bestie, Kim, and her boyfriend, Greg, who's also my ex. Awkward, right? But I have you now, so we can all be friends. Reading the situation, I realized I had to go along with it. So I stroked her hair and said, Yes, my honey muffin, anything you want. My cheesy lines seemed to work, as they both looked annoyed, then left. So I turned to look at Nora and stammered. Did you just say I'm your boyfriend? Nora said nonchalantly, Yeah, isn't that okay? If you don't like it, forget it. Then she was about to leave. I pulled her hand and said, Yes, of course. Sounds great. So that's how we became an official couple. We went on a few dates and she was her usual demanding self. Not that I'd want her any other way. Then one time after a month of dating, Nora dragged me to a swan lake in a nearby park. She looked at me for a long time and then said, Kai, I'm studying abroad for a year. I leave tomorrow. I glared at her in surprise and asked why she hadn't told me sooner. She continued, I guess I didn't want to make you sad, and I don't know if your feelings are big enough, so write down your feelings for me and give them to me tomorrow. That night, I carefully wrote down all my thoughts and feelings for her. I still had hope that this one year of long-distance love would be over quickly. The next day, I drove her to the airport and handed her my letter. To my surprise, Nora also gave me a letter and told me over and over that I could only read it when I got home. Of course, I obeyed her. Then read it as soon as I passed my door. And whoa, I wasn't expecting this. In it, Nora confessed all this time she was just using me to get revenge on her ex and took advantage of me to get over him. That night we had first met, she found out about him and Kim 
but now she regretted how she treated me. At the end of the letter, she wrote, If fate wants us to be together, then we'll meet again one day. What? I was so shocked, so I called to tell her she didn't need to feel guilty and that I forgave her. I kept calling, but it didn't work. I also asked her friends, but no one knew how to reach her. She disappeared from all social media, and just like that, she vanished from my life. I missed Nora so much and found myself hoping that fate would reunite me with her someday. Then one time while I was surfing YouTube, this web drama called My Destiny Is Yours caught my eyes. Curious, I decided to check it out. And I watched wide-eyed as my story with Nora played out in front of me through each episode. This definitely was written by Nora. But how would she end it? It stopped at the part where the girl left and cut off all contact with the guy. An announcement popped up on the screen. The finale was launching at 9pm tonight. I anxiously watched the seconds tick by. During the last episode, the two characters met up at a swan lake. I had a hunch, so without a second delay, I immediately ran to the swan lake in the nearby park. My heart flipped when I saw a girl standing there. It was Nora. Man, I ran so fast and hugged her. She hugged me back, then said, I was a little nervous you wouldn't see the movie. Then she smirked. But it doesn't matter anyway. I could have just texted you, come to the swan lake now, and you would have come, right? Then we both burst out laughing and continued to hug each other. Well, you see, fate brought me and Nora together. And this logic-loving skeptic is now a big believer in destiny. How about you? Have you found your destiny yet? Hi, everyone. Have you ever had someone get revenge on you? It's not fun, right? Well, this is my story about revenge, but with a twist. You won't believe who my prankster turned out to be. Oh, let me introduce myself. I'm Audrey, and I'm 24. To say I've had an unhappy life would be an understatement. Firstly, my dad ditched my mom for another woman. And not long after that, my mom passed away from a serious illness. Basically, my entire life fell apart in a matter of months, and I was still too young at that time. It was tough growing up, and I always think that my life could never turn the page again. But on one fine day, someone popped into my life and changed everything. His name was Jim, and he was seven years older than me, and he seriously turned my life around. He lived in another city, but he often came to my city on business trips. We fell for each other quickly. That happiness didn't last long, though. One day I was working in the clothes store when a girl around the same age as me came in. She wanted my help to choose some dress, but she was pretty rude to me, and I kept catching her staring at me with evil eyes. Who was she, and why was she treating me like that? Finally, after about two hours, she made up her mind and picked up only a tie that she wanted to buy for her husband instead. I was relieved to get rid of her, but shocked when I saw the name on her credit card. Jim Stewart. Her husband had the exact same name as my boyfriend. What a coincidence. She must have caught me staring at the card because she suddenly said, Yes, Jim is my husband. Now stay away from him. What? Her husband? My Jim. Before I even had a chance to react, she turned to everyone in the store and said, This girl is a gold digger, and she's trying to break up my marriage. I was shocked. I tried to explain that it wasn't true, but she wouldn't listen to me. She just stormed out, and I was left standing there hearing people whispering about me. It was the most humiliating moment of my life. I immediately ran to the staff room and called Jim. I was really hoping it had all been a big misunderstanding, but I could tell from Jim's tone that it was the truth. He told me he'd lied to me, and that he actually lived in the same city. He just made up the business trip stuff so he wouldn't have to see me often. Then he said, Audrey, I honestly love you. I'm serious about us. Hang on, was he for real? It was ridiculous. I was disgusted by him. How could he treat me like that? I hung up and felt horrified. It brought back horrible memories of the woman who stole my dad away from my mom. I didn't want to be that woman. The next day, I moved out of the house Jim had rented for me. I didn't want to be associated with that loser anymore. But life works in mysterious ways. The day I moved into my new house, I saw Jim's wife. And you won't believe it. It seemed that she just moved in next door too. Was this some kind of joke? As soon as she saw me, she smirked and said, Wow, what a coincidence. Hello, neighbor. I'm Linda. Seeing her unpacking her stuff all by herself, I couldn't help but wonder where Jim was. But then I thought maybe Linda had ended things with him and had moved here alone. I hope so anyways. I'd hate to have Jim as a neighbor. So that's when my new life began. And it has been crazy ever since. 
From that first week of living there, Linda started pranking me. It all began with her throwing trash into my yard. I even caught her doing it and she just grinned and said, Oops, my hand slipped. Then she walked away laughing. It made me furious. And that was just the beginning. One weekend, a delivery guy rocked up on my porch with 10 extra large pizzas. I tried to explain I hadn't ordered them. And that's when Linda appeared at my door and said, Oh, thanks for ordering me dinner, Audrey. I'm starving. Then she grabbed five of the pizzas and ran to her house, leaving me there with a bill of $100. Jeez, it was so annoying. And I had no option but to pay. Linda was too much. Seriously. As much as her pranks drove me up the wall, I also felt sorry for her. I knew what it was like to have someone you love stolen away from you. She must have hated me so much for ruining her marriage even though it hadn't been my fault. I decided to just put up with her pranks. She'd get over it eventually, and it's not like they were harming me, right? Well, one night I heard the doorbell. I wasn't expecting anyone and was surprised to see a young guy standing there with a poster that said, I agree to be your boyfriend. Come out with me. I was totally puzzled and told him he had the wrong house, but then he showed me the address on the other side. It was my address. What on earth? I told him I wasn't interested, but he tried to grab my hand and said, Come on, girl, don't be shy. I told him if he didn't leave me alone, I'd call the police. So luckily, he ran away. Needless to ask, I knew for sure that was Linda's joke. But this time, she had taken it too far. I decided to go over and have a word with her once and for all. As I was walking to her house, I saw someone familiar on the other side of the road. I couldn't believe it. It was my dad? So many years had passed, and he'd completely changed. But there was no doubt it was him. I suddenly blurted out, Dad? But I didn't know what to do next. I was just thinking about my next move when I felt someone behind me. I turned around and saw Linda. She just smirked at me and walked away. What was her problem? Did she hear what I just said? I was so shocked at seeing my dad, I ran back into my house. I hated him for what he'd done to my mom. But he was still my dad, and I wanted to know if he was okay and what he was doing here. I barely slept that night as I couldn't stop thinking about my dad. The next morning, I was sitting by the window when he appeared again. This time, he was with Linda, and she was holding his arm. What was she doing with my dad? Why were they so close? Later that day, I saw him again, and this time, he and Linda were hugging. OMG, were they dating? Maybe Linda had heard me call him dad, and now she was flirting with him to truly get revenge on me. This was too much. The thought of Linda as a stepmom made me want to puke. I waited and waited, but he was inside her house and there was no sign of him leaving. Eventually he left and as soon as he was in his car, I ran over to her house. I was shaking as I knocked on the door and as Linda opened it, I said, You are way too much. Can you just stop with the revenge already? Linda looked confused and said, What the heck are you talking about? Linda still didn't seem to get it. And I was about to explain when I heard footsteps. I turned around and my dad was right there. He said, What's the matter, Linda? Why are you fighting with this stranger? Huh? Stranger? Didn't he recognize me? Then Linda butted in and said, It's okay, Dad. We're just having a misunderstanding here. What? Dad? Is he your dad? Really? I stammered. Yeah, why? What's the matter? He said, Linda, you don't need to lie to me. I know you're dating my dad to get revenge on me. I continued. Whoa. Hold on. What do you mean your dad? Linda gasped. At that, my dad looked confused too and walked to me and asked if he could look at my hand. After seeing my birthmark, he started crying and hugging me. Audrey, it's you. It's really you. I didn't know how to react, so I just let him hug me. It had been so long since anyone had held me like this. Ever since my mom had died, I'd tried to be strong and keep it together, but suddenly I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears in his arms. We stood like that for a long time, and eventually he took me into Linda's house and told me the story. It turned out, after he left me and my mom, he got tricked by that woman, and he was so ashamed, he decided to move to another city and start over. He was working hard on a construction site one day when he got injured, so he ended up in hospital. And that's when he met Linda. She'd been in a car accident and needed a blood transfusion urgently. She has a pretty rare blood type, but luckily my dad had the same type and he volunteered to give her a transfusion. After that, they became quite close, and seeing as Linda had lost both her parents in the car accident, my dad eventually adopted her. I couldn't believe it. My dad had been through so much, and this whole time, 
I thought he was off living his life with a rich woman. I felt so bad for him and decided to leave the past behind and forgive him. As for Linda, she was also left confused by this coincidence, so she left the room to process everything, while I and Dad took time to catch up on our lives. Later, Linda prepared dinner for us three, and before we digged in, she shyly grabbed my hand and said, Audrey, I've been so awful to you. I'm sorry. I know you aren't the one responsible for my divorce, but I still felt upset and that's why I played all those pranks. That was so childish, right? Please forgive me, sister. We laughed it off, then hugged each other to make peace. I couldn't believe it. After all these years of being lonely, suddenly I had a sister and my dad was back. My life had finally turned a corner and I almost laughed at the thought that it was all because of meeting Jim. At least one good thing had come out of that disastrous relationship. Have you ever wondered what being a parent would be like? How about if you suddenly became a parent and your parent became a teenager? Well, it happened to me and I'm here to tell you all about it. Hello everybody, my name's Heaven and I'm 17. But don't let my name deceive you, because this heaven came straight out of hell. I suppose I've never been the easiest child. Back when I was younger, I had a lot of temper tantrums and outbursts. Once, when I was eight, this boy took the green crayon I wanted, so I snatched it off him, then snapped it in half. He burst into tears, and the teacher got involved and tried to put me in the timeout corner, so I screamed at her and even gave her some bruises. The teacher rang my parents and told them this was the last strike and I'd been expelled. When they picked me up, my dad just sighed and stayed quiet, but my mom yelled at me. Well, I hope you're happy now, heaven. You've brought shame to our family and now we've got to find another school willing to take you. Now, nine years later, and the relationship between mom and me is worse than ever. We just don't see eye to eye on anything. To be honest, we're like strangers. She has absolutely no idea what it feels like to be a teenager, and her super strict rules are ridiculous. Such as, no boyfriends until I'm 18, no parties, no drinking, no staying out past 8.30 p.m., no unhealthy foods. No, 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 no. She was such a fun killer. Jeez, who was she to try and control me like this? Ugh. Me being me, I tried to find my way around these stupid rules. I made out I was having a girly sleepover at my friend Clara's house, then ended up going to a party. I said I was at an after-school club, when really, I went on a date with a boy. And I chucked the healthy packed lunches she made me in the trash and ordered a greasy burger and loaded cheese fries instead. I hated the fact that mom was ruining my life with all of her dumb rules, and she hated the fact that I didn't respect her enough to follow her dumb rules. Because of this, we argued. A lot. And my little bro John and my dad often found themselves stuck in the middle. I guess that they couldn't stand the icy atmosphere between us. So eventually, they themselves prepared for a family day out. And it was certainly going to fix nothing. Her rules still followed us to the park, and she'd even stopped me talking to this really cute guy and shouted at me to go mind John. Ugh! I wasn't here to be a maid. Then when we got home, she insisted I help her cook dinner. So I poured dad a beer, and when I thought mom wasn't looking, I slurped back the rest of the can. Suddenly, my mom screamed out, What do you think you're doing? You're too young to be drinking. I just rolled my eyes and said, What? It was a tiny sip. Stop being so uptight, else you'll turn into a wrinkly old prune. Then I threw the can on the floor and walked off. She gave me a fierce glare, but I didn't care. How could she be just so serious? So when we were all sitting around the table for dinner, I could feel the tension between me and mom. She passed John a plate full of chicken nuggets, but she passed me a plate heaped full of broccoli. Yuck. Um, where are my nuggets? I asked. Mom replied, John is a growing boy. You, however, need to eat some vegetables, as you're getting a little chubby. How dare she? I wasn't even fat. In fact, I'm so skinny, I could be a model. If anyone needed to watch their weight, it was her, not me. 
She was the one squeezing herself into her old pair of skinny jeans. So I grabbed my plate of broccoli and threw it in the trash. Mom got up and said, Fine, go hungry, see if I care, and you can clean up after yourself from now on. I yelled back, Ridiculous! There's nothing in my stomach and you're giving me chores? Is this child abuse? But then my dad startled us by slamming his fist on the table. That's enough! Both of you, start acting like grown-ups! We both muttered out sorry. Then Dad came up with his bonkers idea. Okay, so if you two cannot live in harmony, why don't you trade places? Mom and I were kind of confused. What do you mean? I said to him. Well, it's simple. Heaven, you'll switch places with Mom and do the housework, shopping, making dinner, and taking care of John, and so on. While Ariana... He looked at Mom. You'll relive your teenage years and go to school. Let's say, for two days. Mom looked thrilled at the prospect of being me. As for me, I wasn't convinced. I mean, who likes doing chores? Besides, tomorrow at school was class picnic day, which meant no classes, lots of tasty food, and plenty of time to stare at cute boys. But Mom seemed so excited at the idea of being me so I decided I could take advantage of this. Does this mean I don't have to follow any stupid rules? I asked, and Mom and Dad nodded in agreement. Okay then, all the strict rules are gone. Does this mean I can eat chocolate in bed? John asked. I grinned. You betcha! Mom just shrugged and said, It's okay, Mom. Now I have to prepare stuff for my picnic. And she excitedly ran upstairs. This would be a breeze. Right? I mean, how hard could being mom actually be? The next morning, John woke me up extra early and insisted I make him breakfast. Yawn. While I was pouring cereal into a bowl for him, mom appeared. She was wearing her hat backwards. Jeez, someone seriously needed to tell her it wasn't the 90s anymore. Have fun, Ariana. I winked at her. You too, mom. She winked back. I watched her through the window. As she got on the school bus, she turned to me and did the peace out sign. Jeez, could she be any more uncool? Whatever, she could be as cringy as she wanted. I didn't care, as I had the whole day at home alone. Or at least, until I had to pick up my bro from school. I didn't bother loading up the dishwasher, and I sidestepped past the massive pile of laundry and decided to spend the morning on the couch watching a chick flick and painting my nails. Ugh, this was the life. A few hours passed, and I was so bored and hungry, so I went into the kitchen to look for food. But the cupboards were empty. Then I noticed a shopping list and some money on the counter. Reluctantly, I walked to the local store but I ignored the list and bought lots of snacks. Hey, I was mom, so I made the rules. In the end, I found myself so bored that I actually ended up doing the laundry. I didn't really know what I was doing, so I threw everything into the machine, fiddled with the dial, and hoped for the best. Then my phone rang. It was Clara. So I answered and she said, Hey, why is your mom here instead of you? I told her about the switch up, then asked her what my mom was up to. She was quiet for a second, then said, Um, well, she's definitely enjoying the picnic. In fact, she's showing Mrs. Puller her dabbing skills. What? My mom was dabbing, which no one did anymore. And in front of our ancient science teacher? Was she trying to humiliate me? Whatever, my mom could get on with it. I had house chores to do. Jeez. What's with chores? They seriously never seem to end. By the end of the day, I was so exhausted that I ordered takeout for everyone, then slumped in front of the TV. I finally had the option to stay out late, but I didn't have the energy to do it. Then, the next day, when I was doing yet more house chores, my friend Patrick sent me a photo. It was Mum. She was wearing a cheerleader's outfit that exposed her midriff. What?! She was just at a casual football match. No one dressed up for that. Then Patrick sent me another picture. In it, Mum was fiddling with her hair and touching some jock's shoulder. O-M-G. Was she trying to flirt with him? Whatever. 
I didn't have time for this. I had to go pick John up from school, then go to the grocery store to get supplies for dinner. We arrived home to find Mom slumped on the couch, surrounded by empty wrappers and cans. On seeing me, she said, Oh, you're back. I told John to go to his room, then I stormed over to Mom and said, What's with all this mess? Clean it up! She just smirked at me and said, Nah, you never clean it up, so why should I? After all, we have switched places, remember? She finished her beer, then burped loudly before she threw the can at my feet, then walked off. This was so annoying. I'd already tidied the living room once today, and now I had to do it again. My mom was so unfair. Then, when I finally managed to grab five minutes to relax with a hot chocolate, loud thudding sounds were coming from upstairs. It was her music. It was so loud, it made the ceiling shake. Jeez. She was so annoying. Then suddenly, it dawned on me. This was how I acted. Mom was just being me. So, okay, I guess I was a little harsh at times. I suppose being mom wasn't as easy as it looks. So I decided to make amends by making a delicious dinner. But there was one problem. I can't cook. In fact, the last time I tried to cook... I set the crepes and the pan on fire. So, for safety purposes, I asked Clara and Patrick to help me. They had cooking class, so they knew what to do. We created a feast of barbecue ribs, burgers, cornbread, salad, grape punch, and for dessert, a chocolate lava cake and blueberry pie. I swear they looked so good, I wanted to drool all over them. Mom came downstairs chewing her gum and scrolling through her phone. But then she looked at the food and stuttered, Huh, huh, how did you make all of this? Not even I could make this many meals. I just shrugged and said, I had a little help from my friends. No biggie. Then I stopped in front of mom and said, I'm sorry that I've been a bad daughter. I know you do a lot for me, and I promise I'll be better from now on. Mom started crying and said, I'm sorry too. I know it isn't easy being your age. I can't keep up with the trends. I thought dabbing was popular. Anyway, from now on, I'll be fair to you, and we'll have fun together. After that, we hugged it out. Then my dad stood up and said, Well, now anyone want to trade places with me? John immediately raised his hand, and all could see his eyes light up. Soon, we all burst out laughing, thinking about one day John will go to work and talk about dinosaurs at the meetings. Meanwhile, my dad is building a Lego castle for John's kindergarten girlfriend. My family is now happier than ever. It's all thanks to my dad's crazy idea. You should never disrespect your parents. Otherwise, you might just find yourself living in their shoes. Literally. And trust me, I'll take strict rules and being nagging parents any day if the alternative is grocery shopping and house chores. Ugh. Hi, my name's Baron, and I'm 17. I guess that every student has at least one teacher that they hate, right? In my case, it's my PE teacher, Mr. Green. You're probably wondering why, so here we go. I'm an academic kid, and the sporty way of life just isn't for me. I actually enjoy studying, especially anything math and science related. I just don't understand why the school forces me to do PE. Spending hours jumping about in a sweaty mess just seems pointless to me. I could be using this time to read a coding book or something. I wasn't built for sports. I was the skinny kid who turned bright red just thinking about running. Then, during one torturous PE lesson, I couldn't jump over the horizontal bar at the boy's height. So the teacher lowered it to the girl's height for me, and worse still, I still couldn't jump over it. Humiliating! And after that, some small-brained boys nicknamed me Miss High Jump. Ugh, how annoying! Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, In steps a new P.E. teacher, Mr. Green. Honestly, he was quite popular at school, as he was good-looking, muscular, and was a national medalist in the pole jump. Whenever he appeared, girls' squeals would be heard across the hall, and boys kept following him to ask about his diet and workout plan to get six-pack abs. Meanwhile, I couldn't stand him a bit. What's so good about that Hulk guy? Once I even spotted him checking out his reflection in his stopwatch. Pathetic. 
Mr. Green made the PE class hell. He always made us do these stupid exercise routines. Then when I messed up, he corrected me in front of everyone. It was so humiliating. Then he said, Baron, I get that sport is your weakness, so let's practice more and then you'll get bigger. Firstly, I didn't want to bulk up. And secondly, his actions made me a complete joke to my classmates. Why was he so strict with me? Was it because I was the only one not staring at him with gooey eyes? Great, as if it wasn't bad enough being called Miss High Jump, now I had Mr. Green to deal with. So game on. It's time I hit him where it hurts, his appearance. I snuck into my mom's room and took one of her red lipsticks. Then I smeared it on his red whistle. And as expected, after blowing it, his lips were fully covered with red lipstick. It was so funny. Not so much Mr. Green anymore, more like Mr. Red. <laughs> Everyone was laughing, but no one told him why. Seeing his confused face was so hilarious. But then he went to the bathroom and seconds later he shouted. I rushed to see his reaction and OMG, it was priceless. However, catching me grinning at the bathroom door, he seemed to know who's to blame. Oops. After that, he was stricter with me. He always made me lug the training equipment for the whole class. Yes, only me. So I decided to get my own back. I poked some small holes in one of the tennis balls, then filled it with black ink. As expected when he hit it, all the ink inside went on his face and clothes. Ha! He looked like an octopus. Of course, he knew it was me, so I ended up with a week's detention, but it was so worth it. That's when Mr. Green got determined to make my life a misery. He forced me to run extra laps on the field and made me attempt hurdles that I was never going to clear. And then he just smirked at me and said something like, Well, young Baron, practice makes perfect. The feud between us was endless. However, I soon had something much more important to care about. There was a new girl in my class called Susie, and oh boy, was she pretty. It was love at first sight, but unfortunately, I wasn't alone in liking her. Whatever, the other boys might have the brawn, but I had the brains. So I spent hours thinking up ways to impress her and to make her mine. I don't have a lot of experience in this sort of thing, so I turned to romantic films for help. And I quickly learned that girls loved soppy gestures, so I put a love letter in her locker. I even sprayed some of my mom's perfume on it. Girls like fragrant things, right? But when she opened the locker door, dozens of letters like mine fell out. Another time, I brought her some cupcakes. I planned to get to class early and leave them on her desk. Only when I stepped in the classroom, her desk was already covered in cakes, chocolate, and drinks. It was like stepping into a candy store. I needed to change the plan. I'd have to think big if I was going to impress Susie. So one day, I asked some friends to go up to Susie and annoy her. And then when she freaked out, I would swoop in to protect her. You know, like a hero. Everything was going according to plan, and I was about to run over and save the day, but then Mr. Green suddenly appeared. He scolded them and even threatened to report them to the principal. They were scared to death and immediately ran away. Mission failed. I was about to leave when suddenly I saw Mr. Green grab Susie's arm and whispered something to her. Whoa, what a slime ball! Susie looked really annoyed, but he didn't give up. I was so mad I ran over there and yelled at him. Let her go, or else I'll report this to the principal. Then, to his surprise, I grabbed her hand and led her away. After a while, I turned to Susie and asked, Are you okay? She smiled and said, Yeah, thanks for helping me. Her bright smile drove me crazy. I stammered, You're welcome. Uh, if he pesters you again, just tell me. And could you believe it? After that day, Susie and I became closer. She even texted me whenever she had problems with math, physics, or other subjects. See? Brain always wins. Then the following week, during another torturous P.E. class, I noticed Mr. Green trying to hand Susie a bottle of water. She wouldn't take it from him, but he kept on trying to pass it to her. What a weirdo. Fueled by love, I ran over to them, grabbed the water bottle, then said, She doesn't want it, so leave her alone. I led her over to the fountain to calm down. Then seeing how sad she looked, I said, Don't worry, I won't let him harm you. She turned to me and replied, It's okay, I don't think he means anything by it. Maybe he just cares about me. I interrupted her. No, he isn't a good guy. He wants you. She laughed and said that I got it all wrong, but I still felt worried, so I said, Today after class, let me walk you home. At first she refused, but I was insistent, so in the end she agreed. After that, I walked her home every day after school, and guess what? It turns out we got on so well. Time zooms by when I'm with her. I guess I should be thanking Mr. Green. It's because of him Susie knows who I am. But nah, he's a jerk. How dare he bug Susie? He was way out of line. He needed to be stopped. 
So one day I went to the sports hall where Mr. Green was arranging equipment, approached him and said, I know you like Susie, but she doesn't like you, so please stop disturbing her. If I report this to the principal, you'll lose your job. He continued to sort out the equipment, then smirking, he replied, It's not any of your business. This made me so mad, so I yelled at him. It is my business, as I love Susie, and I'll protect her at all costs. He laughed. You're not in a position to talk to me about this. Come back when you're Susie's official boyfriend. What? How dare he say that? His words played on my mind. So that evening, I decided to go to Susie's house to confess my feelings towards her. However, as soon as I arrived, I saw Mr. Green standing in front of her house. He grabbed her hand and hugged her. How dare he? Anger took over me as I quickly ran over, pulled Susie away, and then to my surprise, I punched him in the face. I don't know who was more shocked, him or me. Ouch, my hand hurt. Before I could say anything, Susie shouted, Dad, are you okay? Dad, what was going on here? I froze and stared at them. Baron, what are you doing? You've got it all wrong, he's my dad. What? Mr. Green was Susie's dad? Well, she could have told me that earlier. We went inside and Susie got the first aid kit and patched up Mr. Green's nose and my hand. Then she told me the truth. Turns out her mom and Mr. Green used to date back in high school. But then her mom fell pregnant with Susie. He freaked out and refused to be part of their lives. So her mom moved away with her. But now they were back in town and Mr. Green was apologetic for how he behaved and wanted to be a father to her. But she was struggling to move on from the past and forgive him. Whoa. I couldn't believe I punched my crush's dad in the face. Talk about embarrassing. Although he looked more humiliated at the fact than me. A skinny boy with no athletic ability had actually made his nose bleed. That night I couldn't get a wink of sleep. Now Susie would never want to see me again and Mr. Green would hate me even more. Ugh, it was a huge mess. After that I tried to avoid Susie at school. As for Mr. Green, he stopped being so strict on me. Was he scared of Miss High Jump's punch now? Ha. <laughs> okay, I know, I shouldn't joke about this. But let me have a laugh. This man has just ruined his chance with the love of his life here. Then one day when I was tiredly walking back home, someone patted my shoulder. I turned back and saw Susie. To my surprise, she said, Hey, you promised to walk me home. Are you breaking your word or something? I stammered. I, I thought you hated me, so... She smiled and said that her dad didn't blame me either. In fact, thanks to my punch, they talked properly and now understood each other more. She leaned her head on my shoulder and said, Baron, thanks for always protecting me. Whoa, this day couldn't be better. The girl of my dreams didn't hate me, result. But I'm still scared to death of her dad. So basically, there are two missions that I need to complete. Firstly, I need to apologize to Mr. Green. And secondly, I need to improve my grade in PE class to impress him. The second mission sounds <laughs> near on impossible. So wish me luck, as I'm going to need it. Hi guys, I'm Chrissy, and my high school life took a drastic turn thanks to my crazy, overprotective mom. You see, my parents divorced when I was a little kid. I stayed with my mom, but she worked for the criminal investigation department, which meant she was super busy, so the house chores remained undone, and we lived off takeaways. Trust me, having pizza and egg fried rice every night isn't as good as it sounds. My grandparents could see that my mom was struggling to juggle her work and home life commitments, so I went to stay with them. I didn't mind this, as mom always visited me on weekends. Besides, grandma's meals are delicious. But then, mom switched departments. She went from chasing criminals to handling paperwork at the station. Due to these changes in circumstances, she had far more time on her hands, so I moved back in with her. It's only by living with her that I realized just how different she is to me. Talk about my opposite, as she's strong, fierce, and impulsive. Basically, she's like a man, while I'm a sweet girly girl who loves wearing pretty clothes and watching cute movies. You can imagine my horror when I invited my bestie, Sharon, over, and mom was walking around the house in a skull print tank top, ripped jeans, and biker boots. She looked like she was going on a bike rally. Yeah, this was just her usual style, but I was expecting she would at least act normal for once when we had a guest around. It was so cringe. She was almost 40, not 15. Then, on my first day of high school, mom insisted she take me there and pick me up, as she was worried there might be troublemakers on the bus. Yep, 
I know, this was ridiculous. I mean, how delicate does she think I am? But I didn't want to upset her, so I reluctantly agreed. School's out and I was chatting with my friends while waiting for my mom to show up when we suddenly heard the sound of a motorbike engine coming toward the school. Me and my friends got excited and whistled as we thought a cute guy was passing by. But then they stopped near us and took off their helmet. I literally wanted to faint. It was my beloved mother. Oh, sweet Jesus, what on earth was she doing? My mom shouted with joy. Hey, Chrissy, get on. Then she held a spare helmet out to me. I swear it was like the whole school was outside watching us. How embarrassing. When we arrived home, I asked her where the bike had come from. She replied, what? Oh, you mean Eleanor? I just bought her last week. The weather is so nice today, so I thought I would bring her along. Yes, you heard her right. My mom named the bike after Eleanor Roosevelt. Unbelievable. The embarrassment didn't end there. Oh no. One day, my teacher informed us that tomorrow after school was a parent-teacher conference. I couldn't have mom turning up in a teenage rebel outfit, so I searched her closet for something mom-like. Nope. All my mom owned were t-shirts, ripped shorts, and crop tops. Ugh! So I went online and found this beautiful blue dress, then I told her to buy it. The next day after school, I waited for mom in my form room. All the parents were already there, only my mom was missing. I was about to call her when suddenly somebody walked into the room. Oh. My. God. Someone, please knock me out right now. It was my mom, and you wouldn't believe what she was wearing. No, it wasn't the blue dress. Instead, it was this super skinny black leather dress, black sunglasses, 10-inch high heels, and a black choker necklace. She looked like she belonged in a vampire movie. Everyone was gawping at her. I think some of the dads were even drooling a bit. When I confronted her about it, she just shrugged and said, Sweetie, this dress is much more my style than that mumsy blue one. Now this was officially my number one most embarrassing moment ever. Thanks, Mom. Why couldn't she be like me? I mean, I was starting to think that I was the adult here, not her. The embarrassment didn't end there. Instead, she took it to a whole new level. My school was planning a camping trip, and I was so excited about it. Mom wanted to come along and supervise, but I firmly said no. She started saying, but honey, you don't know how dangerous the woods are. What if you got bitten by a snake? Do you know how to handle that? I don't think so. What? She was just being ridiculous again. We argued for a while, but in the end, she agreed to let me go without her. The trip was so much fun, and some cute boys asked Sharon and me if we wanted to go for a swim in the lake. Of course, we said yes. I mean, look at them. They were so cute. Suddenly, I heard screaming. It was Sharon. She said someone was hiding in the bushes and watching us. That was so creepy. The cute boys said they'd go and check it out, but then this person jumped out of the bush and did a judo throw on them. Wait a minute. I know that move. Could it be? Oh no. It was my mom. What was she wearing? She was in full army gear. She even had binoculars. Jeez, mom. What were you doing looking like a G.I. Joe? I couldn't hold my tears and I cried out, Oh my god, why can't you leave me alone? You're ruining everything. Then I ran back to the camp. She left after that, but I felt so embarrassed for the rest of the trip. When I returned home, my mom immediately said sorry to me and swore that something like that would never happen again. Okay, I could see in her eyes that she really meant it, so I would give her another chance. She calmed down a lot after that and even let me go to school by myself. Well, that was big progress, don't you think? Soon after that, I started to date this boy named Kevin, and boy, was he hot! He was one of the popular kids at school, so I still couldn't believe he chose me. I don't know how mom found out about him, but she did, and she insisted on inviting him over for dinner. I made her agree not to do anything crazy. I mean, what was the worst that could happen? The dinner was going well, 
until we got to dessert. Then mom started asking him awkward questions like, Kevin, how many girls have you dated? And I assume you two have health classes at school? Or should I remind you of some important facts? Oh, sweet Jesus, mom. Her questions were beyond embarrassing. Kevin just sat there with a super awkward smile on his face and didn't answer. But then mom announced it was very late and practically shoved him out of the house. Huh, it was only 8.30 p.m. After he left, I went straight to my mom and we started arguing. Mom, you agreed not to do anything crazy. Why can't you act like a normal mom? She replied, Oh, honey, that Kevin guy is really cute, but he's not good for you. I know his type. They only want to take advantage of girly girls like you. What? Girly girls like me? What was that supposed to mean? I shouted back, You're doing it again! You're being overprotective! That's because you're not tough enough. If you wouldn't be so girly and be a badass like your mom, I wouldn't have to protect you all the time. I stormed up to my room and slammed the door shut. I was so going to prove to her that she was wrong about Kevin and that I didn't need her protection. Fortunately, mom hadn't scared Kevin off. Phew! He told me that his parents were super embarrassing too. One evening, Kevin took me to this nice restaurant. There were candles, live music, and the food was delicious. It was so romantic. Then he touched my hand and leaned in closer. This was so exciting. I was about to have my first kiss. Suddenly, someone banged on the table nearby and ruined the moment. That's when I noticed they had a keychain on their bag that looked exactly like the one I'd made once at summer camp. I stood up and walked toward the table. A middle-aged lady with blonde hair and sunglasses was sitting there. I tried to look at her face, but it was like she was avoiding me. I took a closer look, and I couldn't believe it. I ripped the wig off her head, and yes, it was my beloved mother again! To be honest, I didn't want to argue with her anymore. Today was proof that she just couldn't change. So I just said in a calm voice, I hate you, mom. You're the worst mom ever. Then I grabbed Kevin's arm and ran out of there. Okay, maybe what I said was a bit harsh, but she just ruined what would have been my first kiss. I couldn't concentrate on our date after that, so I asked Kevin to take me home. But to my surprise, he drove me back to his place. Uh-oh, I knew what that meant. But I wasn't ready for any of that yet, so I told him I'd get an Uber. Suddenly, he grabbed my arm and tried to drag me into his house. I couldn't believe this was actually happening. Mom was so right about him. I was freaking out. But then suddenly, I remembered something important that she taught me, so I used her signature judo move on him. It worked, as he laid on the ground and groaned out in pain. Ha! Huh. And that's when my mom arrived on her motorbike. As soon as I saw her, I ran over to her, hugged her tight, and cried like a baby in her arms. You must be wondering how my mom found me. Well, when Kevin came by to have dinner, she pickpocketed his phone and hacked it so she had access to all his messages and location. So after I dragged him out of the restaurant, he texted his friends saying he was trying to get in bed with me at all costs, which my mom saw, so she rushed to rescue me. Oh God, mom, that was so not okay. But what could you expect from a criminal investigator? When we arrived home, we had a serious talk. To my surprise, she admitted that she was wrong about me. She saw now that I was able to take care of myself. That judo move I did on Kevin really impressed her. See? Girly girls can kick some butt too. So from that moment on, things between us improved lots. Turns out, my mom isn't so annoying after all. I realize now that she's pretty cool, and all the things she did were just to protect me. Okay, so maybe she took it to the extreme levels, but she did it with good intentions. Thanks to my mom, I feel stronger now. You know what they say, I'm a strong woman because a strong woman raised me. Although, one thing's for sure, I won't be borrowing her clothes anytime soon. Ever feel like your family is cursed? 
I live with my grandma, my mom, and my older sister. I'm surrounded by women, but not one man. It must be a curse, because my grandparents had a terrible marriage, and my parents' marriage was a total fail, too. So this made my mom and grandma super sensitive around men. They thought all men were dangerous and always warned me and my sister not to go near boys. I'm Gemma, by the way, and my sister's name is Lacey. She's the sweet one who always listens to what mom and grandma say, and I guess you could say I'm a rebel child. Most of my friends were boys, but of course, my family didn't know that. Whenever I spoke about my friends, I pretended they were all girls. Otherwise, my mom would probably kill me. Even though I was surrounded by male friends, when it came to love, it was a whole other story. I was actually quite shy about it all. Maybe my mom and grandma really had rubbed off on me, because whenever a boy told me he liked me, I didn't believe him. One time, in middle school though, I almost believed this boy. He said he had a huge crush on me, and would even die for me. He would literally sit outside our front door from morning to night, waiting until I agreed to be his girlfriend. But he couldn't escape the wrath of my mom. When she caught him, she threw a bucket of water at him, and he immediately ran away. Clearly, he wouldn't die for me then. <laughs> there were other boys who also said they couldn't live without me, but I still see them wandering around alive and well, so I guess my mom and grandma were right. Men are a bunch of liars. But there were always exceptions, and my exception was Brett. Oh, dreamy Brett. I met him in a record store, and we both went to grab the same record at exactly the same time. I was smitten from first glance. All those warnings about boys left my head, and I could barely see. My eyes had turned to heart emojis. The rest was history. We fell in love and became a couple. And eventually, I plucked up the courage to bring him home. I bet no one could deny a cute guy like him, my grandma and mom included. Little did I know that I was just inviting him into the lion's den. As soon as he stepped into our house, he gave my grandma a hug and said, You must be Gemma's mom. I can see where she gets her good looks. Then he turned to my mom and said, Hi, Lacey. You're even prettier than in the photos. But then, of course, Lacey appeared. And the realization dawned on Brett's face, and he laughed and said he hadn't expected me to have such a young and beautiful grandma and mom. My mom and grandma were trying hard to hide their amusement, and Brett just winked at me. Oh, boy. He was cunning. <laughs> In the middle of dinner, when Brett went to the bathroom, I noticed my mom and grandma grinning at each other. They were up to something. What if they put something in his food? I didn't trust them one bit and asked them what was going on. But they just smiled sweetly and said, Nothing, sweetie pie. I took a bite of his mashed potato, and it was so salty. I asked them why they'd done it, and my grandma said, We just want to see if he's a liar like all other men. Honey, let's see if he'll choose to be a polite or an honest man. When Brett came back, my grandma asked him if he liked her cooking, and he said, It's delicious, thanks. I like that you don't hold back on the salt. Really brings out the natural flavors of the potato. Ha! That's my boy! Well done, Brett! My grandma and mom didn't end their pranks there, though. They were determined to make a fool of Brett. My mom asked him to help her get dessert from the fridge, and she put a fake plastic spider on top of the cake. She obviously wanted to frighten him, but he didn't fall for it. He just scooped it off and left it on the table. And then after dinner, my grandma asked if he wanted to join her for a post-dinner smoke, and he politely declined. It was clear they weren't going to find his weaknesses that easily. When we finished dinner, Lacey went up to her room. Shortly after, my grandma and mom suddenly said they heard someone was calling outside, so they stood up and came out to check. I could see their frustrated faces as they couldn't find any reason to forbid my love story with Brett, so they must be going out to discuss. I told Brett to wait in the kitchen while I went to eavesdrop on them, but as soon as I walked into the hallway, all the lights went off, and I heard someone kicking the door down. I was so panicked that I just uncontrollably screamed loudly and could not stop shaking, 
holding my head and screaming for help in panic. God, I could even hear a sound like a gun being loaded. We were about to be robbed? I just stood there, frozen in place. I was terrified. But then, I felt a hand on my shoulder and almost jumped out of my skin. But luckily, it was just Brett. He pulled me close to him while holding something like a candlestick holder. Then he was about to leave me there to face whomever caused this. But I was so scared that I just held him tight and started sobbing. Suddenly, the lights came back on. After being dazzled for a moment, I noticed my mom and grandma standing right there in front of me. My grandma shouted, Who are you? I didn't know what she was talking about. So I looked up at Brett and jumped. <gasps> it wasn't Brett. It was some random guy. I ran towards my mom and said, He's a robber. He has a gun. My grandma just laughed and said, There are no robbers, silly. This was just a test for your boyfriend. We wanted to see how brave he was. Then, my grandma jerked her head towards the kitchen, and there Brett was, cowering under the table. Really? How did my mom and grandma expect him to react in such a dangerous situation? Anyway, it's such an embarrassment when seeing him like that. But wait, who was this random guy? Suddenly he spoke and said, um, actually, I'm Chris, Lacey's boyfriend. My mom and grandma looked so shocked. My mom screamed upstairs. Lacey, get down here at once. Well, this was awkward. Turns out Chris and Lacey had been secretly dating for over a year. He even had a rope ladder that he used to climb into her room every weekend. I couldn't believe it. I glanced over at Lacey. This whole time, I thought this young lady was innocent and up there reading in her bedroom, when actually, she just pretended to be a true believer of whatever mom and grandma said and was sneaking around with a boyfriend behind all of our backs. Greater wisdom than me. Although, there was no denying that Chris was a good guy. As soon as the lights had gone out, he'd hidden Lacey in a corner and came down to investigate and take care of me without worrying about the danger of it all. Poor Brett. He hadn't passed this test, but I couldn't blame him. As for my mom and grandma, they were so shocked, they couldn't even speak. Lacey asked them to accept Chris and give them official permission to date. But my mom and grandma just ignored her and went to their rooms. After that, Chris was over a lot, but my mom and grandma treated him in the same way they'd done with Brett, always testing him. One night, they even did a quiz to see how intelligent he was, and they even sent fake messages to Lacey's phone, pretending to be another guy, to see how jealous he'd get. But he didn't fall for it. Him and Lacey were a solid couple. Poor Chris and Brett. They couldn't catch a break. My mom and grandma constantly said Brett was a coward and Chris was sneaky, and they were so rude to them. I realized no man could ever please them, their pasts still haunted them, and their prejudices were so extreme. But no matter how much they hated our boyfriends, Lacey and I weren't going to give up. My grandma's birthday arrived, and Lacey and I said we had a big present for her. Grandma's response was, Girls, the only present I want right now is for you both to dump those boyfriends of yours. That's the only thing that will make me happy. Lacey smiled and said, Sure, Grandma, anything for you. Then she pulled out a pregnancy test and said, But Grandma, I'm having a baby with Chris. If it'll make you happy, though, I'll break up with him and raise the baby by myself, just like how you raised Mom and how Mom raised Gemma and me. My mom and Grandma looked like they were going to pass out. And before they could say anything more, I continued, Brett and I will break up, too. Although, I want you to know how much I love him. If you'd prefer me to be lonely for the rest of my life, I'll do it. Because like you always say, men are poison. In fact, I've decided to become a nun. I'm quitting school, and I'll leave for the monastery next week. At this, my mom burst into tears and grabbed my hand and said, Baby, no, don't choose such a lonely path. Stay with us. My grandma was also crying and hugging Lacey, saying, Sweetie, don't be stupid. 
Your baby can't grow up without a dad. Chris is an amazing guy. Don't listen to me. He's great. I'm so sorry. So, there you have it. Lacey and I are still with Chris and Brett, and we couldn't be happier. Mom and Grandma have accepted them, and dare I say it, they're even nice to them now. There's just one small problem, though. How is Lacey going to explain the fact that her belly isn't growing? Wink, wink. <laughs> Looks like my mom and grandma aren't the only ones good at testing people. It must run in our family. Wish us luck. Hey, I'm Henry, and I'm a 23-year-old from Hamburg, and I have one question. You must have heard of K-pop, right? So, any K-pop fans in the house? Of course, I'm one. To be specific, I am an ARMY, a true BTS stan. Oh, and for those who don't know, stan is slang for when you're a big fan of something. Anyway, I can proudly say I'm obsessed with K-pop, and it's such a fun journey, right? But not everyone gets it. In fact, this is my story about how people treated me for being a fanboy, and it gets pretty dramatic. So, people always think that we like K-pop just because the idols are good-looking. But no, that's not only it. Seriously, I bet those who hate K-pop haven't even given it a proper listen. So you K-pop haters, just hear me out, and I'll start by tracing all the way back to the beginning of that life-changing moment when I first discovered K-pop. It all started when my classmate Chrissy was watching this music video called Dope during recess. I got curious and joined her. And oh boy, i never seen something so incredible before. The camera work, the choreography, it was unreal. I couldn't get the song out of my head, and the video was so much fun to watch. They didn't need hot girls nor supercars to make it eye-catching. It's pure talent only. After that, I started to listen to more K-pop and became a multi-stan, but BTS is always my one true love. I love them, and I wouldn't mind sharing all about it on my Instagram, which also helps me make friends with a lot of other ARMY from all around the world. Mostly girls, but a lot of guys too. And they often message me saying how much they admire me for being so open about my love for K-pop. They say they wish they had the same courage I did, since a lot of them got made fun of for liking Korean male artists. How ridiculous is that? It's 2021. We can like who we like, and we shouldn't have to keep quiet about our passions. However, I totally understood how they felt. I've been there, and it was rough. One time in high school, I'd been so excited to show Chrissy my new BTS album. We were screaming and squealing as I carefully flipped through each page as if it was my most prized possession, when some jock walked by with his crew and snatched it out of my hand. Then he said, What is this tween magazine? Didn't they all have plastic surgery? Right? Then another guy said, Why do you like these guys? Are you gay or something? Then they all walked off laughing. I was so angry I wanted to kick them so far off the earth, even Google wouldn't be able to find him. But I couldn't do anything. They were way bigger than me and would crush me into a pulp if I even tried. So I came up with a better idea. I started going to the gym. I wanted to be buff like June Kook. Then I wouldn't be afraid of any losers picking on me and my boys anymore. Oh, and by the way, I'm not gay. That's just another thing us fanboys have to deal with. There's nothing wrong with being gay, but just assuming I am because I like K-pop is silly. K-pop is for anyone and everyone. Anyway, after high school, things were looking up as people in college were less nosy. We'd all grown up, and you won't believe how muscular I'd become. Girls started showing interest in me, but there was only one girl I had eyes for. Her name was Kayla, and she was so cute. However, there was just one tiny problem. And by tiny, I mean huge. She didn't like K-pop. Once when we were studying, she sat closer to me and asked with a smile, What are you listening to? Then she took one side of my earphones. What is this? Some kind of chanting? Then she just went back to reading with a disgusted look on her face. What? That was my bias. Rap Monster was spitting fire. I didn't know she was that tasteless, but I let it slide this time, since I didn't want to make a big deal out of it in the library. After that, things got worse, and her hatred for K-pop became more obvious. Every time I talked about it, she rolled her eyes and changed the subject. And when the new music videos came out, and I couldn't wait to show her, she'd just scroll on her phone and ignore it. Other than that, she was always so sweet, and so we kept on dating. But we shouldn't have. One time, we were hanging out at the mall, and it was a pretty special day for me, as it was BTS's debut anniversary. 
I was so excited and had even worn my BTS crossbody bag with a Koya keychain to complete the look. I thought I looked cool, but Kayla burst out laughing when she saw me and said, OMG, did you borrow your sister's bag or something? I tried to explain to her and said, no, it's mine, and this is my baby Koya. But she just cut me off and rolled her eyes, as she said we'd be late for the movies. She kinda killed my vibe, but it was BTS day, so I wouldn't let anything ruin it. We were lining up to buy popcorn when I felt someone tap me on the shoulder. Excuse me, I couldn't help noticing your Koya. Are you perhaps an army? I finished his sentence with a scream. We were both excited. We basically talked in gibberish that probably only ARMY could understand. Turns out J-Hope was his bias, and his name was Craig. Then he even gifted me some photo cards he'd just printed out. I was so immersed in the conversation with him, I forgot Kayla was even there. Until Craig said to her, Oh, hey, who's your bias? I might have some cards for you too. Kayla looked offended and said, You guys are sick. What a pair of losers. I've had enough of this K-pop stuff. Then she stormed off. We were left stunned, but oh well. If she couldn't respect my hobby and love me for who I am, then fine. Good riddance, Kayla. After that, Craig and I went to a cafe to talk everything BTS. And until this day, we're still good friends. And I'm grateful he saved me from dating that awful girl any longer. After that relationship, I gave my love life a bit of a break. As I was busy with streaming music videos, voting for BTS on award shows, and catching up with all of their content, on top of studying. I was perfectly happy living my little fanboy life without any girl. But then one day, everything changed. I was on the bus to class, because I wasn't feeling well enough to drive after a white night watching BTS's live stream. I must have dozed off because the next moment I woke up, and I was leaning on some girl's shoulder. I quickly apologized to her, and she just giggled. Then I took a proper look, and oh my gosh, I've never met such a beautiful girl in my life. She was like a mixture of all four members of Blackpink. Luckily, I was smart enough to ask her for her number, and offered to buy her a drink to make up for almost drooling on her shoulder. After class, we met at a Starbucks and immediately hit it off. Her name was Clara, and she was so smart and pretty, I gotta make her mine. So I decided to change my tactic a little. I would wait a bit before telling her I was a fanboy. And instead, I focused on finding out more about her first and making it clear I really liked her. Then, when the right time came, I'd share with her my passion for K-pop. Pretty soon, we got quite serious and did everything together. And I finally felt the moment had come. I was driving her home and decided to put my K-pop playlist on. To my surprise, she looked interested and asked what it was. I told her how much I loved it and then nervously asked her, Are you really okay with it? because usually when I tell people, they make fun of me. She just smiled and said, okay, now it's my turn. Then she put on some death metal, which almost made my hair stand on end. She laughed and said, I know how you feel. Death metal isn't everyone's cup of tea either, but hey, we're allowed to like whatever we want, right? I respect that you love K-pop. Oh my gosh, could Clara be any more perfect? I can't wait to show her my room too. But unexpectedly, on the night I invited her over, her face changed as she saw all my posters and merch. I showed her my collections, my dolls, my pictures, but she just smiled and stared at me. Then she took my hand and said, Henry, this is really cool, but don't you think it's a bit much? I know you love them, but you should maybe start spending your money on stuff for your future too. Then she told me she wanted to go home. Can't deny that I was hurt, but I knew that she's the one for me, and she just needed a little time to really understand that this was more than just a hobby for me. So I was determined to get her to like K-pop. I started sending her songs and recommending her some Korean shows to watch. Once, I even pretended I was taking her out for a picnic, but I took her to an army fest. Clara went along with it all, but she didn't seem too interested. Then came the best news ever. I found out BTS was going to have a concert in London. I was desperate to go and told Clara about flying there for the concert, but she said, Henry, isn't that the same day as our marketing contest? There will be headhunters there and everything. You can't miss it. This is your chance to secure a good job. I didn't care and replied with a joke, but I've been waiting to see them my whole life. This is a dream come true. Who needs a job when you have BTS? I'm going to London, baby. But Clara didn't laugh. In fact, she got super angry and started shouting at me saying that I was so immature and that if I didn't grow up soon, she couldn't be with me anymore. She was even crying, saying she needed a responsible man who was thinking about his future as she stormed off. After that, she gave me the silent treatment. 
I was stuck in a dilemma. It was my biggest dream to see BTS live. But why did this feel so wrong? I decided to wait a few days to think it all through. And eventually I realized there would be other concerts, right? I really couldn't skip the contest. I mean, how else would I support BTS without money? I did need a job. So even though it broke my fanboy heart, I told Clara I'd skip the concert this time and go to the contest. Clara immediately grinned and said, Really? I'm so proud of you, Henry. Then she gave me a big kiss, and I reminded myself this was all worth it. And at least I still had my girlfriend. But suddenly Clara started speaking again. Henry, there's something I need to tell you. Um, actually, Professor Geller has told me that the contest has been put off temporarily. So... This was just a test. Then she said she just wanted to see if I could figure out my priorities. She loved how passionate I was about K-pop, but everything needed balance, and she wanted to make sure I would take other parts of my life as seriously as I took K-pop. Then she handed me her phone and said, Look, I couldn't believe it. It was two tickets to the BTS show. She'd bought them for me. I was so happy I burst into tears and couldn't stop hugging her. I thought that was the happiest moment of my life. But... The BTS concert was, especially as Clara was by my side. We're currently still together, and guess what? She even biases Jin now. She's seriously the perfect girl for me, and I can't wait to spend my life with her. If in 2031 you ever see a family of four screaming their heads off at a BTS concert, chances are it's me and Clara and our future kids. Don't be shy. Come say hi. I am who I am, but you're just too selfish to accept it. And also, you love the person you created in your fantasy, not me. So, I think we should end it here. It's for the best. So, that's me there. Yep, the blubbering girl. And the boy, that's Edward, the love of my life. I knew this would happen, as it's said as much in both mine and Edward's horoscopes. It'd been written in the stars. How unfair was that? It all began on a normal, sunny day. I started it as I always did, by reading my horoscope. My eyes widened when I saw what it said. Today, your paths will cross with your soulmate. Oh, my days? This was it. I was finally going to meet my Prince Charming. I was so excited that I had a skip to my step as I made my way to school. Oh, by the way, I'm a Taurus sun in Pisces moon. I understand that not everyone's as clued up on these things as I am. But basically, this means I'm a shy girl who's timid around strangers, but I have great empathy towards others. However, my main trait is that I daydream to escape from reality. The one problem with being a daydreamer is that other people were constantly telling me I should be louder, brasher, sassier. Ugh, no thanks. That isn't who I am. Seriously. They should borrow all my all you need to know about your star sign book and look it up or go and find a Leo. I trust my horoscopes so much that I live my life by them. In fact, horoscopes have saved me on more than one occasion. For instance, there was this one day I refused to go to class at all cost because my daily horoscope said you may get caught up in an accident at work or school so proceed with caution. And you wouldn't believe what happened in science class. One of my classmates spilled acid all over the place. Luckily, no one was hurt, but still, thank God I wasn't there. Horoscopes are super important to me, but so is my love of Korean dramas, especially the romantic ones. Swoon. I always imagine all kinds of cute situations in which I find the love of my life who is as handsome, as funny, and caring as the male leads in the drama series. And that's why no guy I've seen ever met my expectations. But my horoscope said it's going to happen. So I was adamant that it would. I wondered what he'd look like and what star sign he'd be. Surely he had to be a cancer, right? We would accidentally bump into each other, fall in love, overcome all difficulties together, and live happily ever after. This was so exciting. I was daydreaming by my locker when I overheard some girls whispering about a new boy named Edward. Curious, I squeezed myself through the crowd and oh my god. This guy had a face like a Greek Adonis. Could he be my prince? There was only one way to know for sure. 
I needed to find out his star sign. But like I said, I'm a shy girl. So I was hardly going to go up to him and ask him for his date of birth, as he'd think I was a weirdo. I continued to daydream about my dilemma and then bingo, I came up with an amazing foolproof idea. See, being a Pisces has its serious perks. As he was new, his file would be at reception for Mrs. Shillington to sort out. I waited until the start of lunch break as I knew it would be quieter around there then. Then, I sneaked over to her desk and scanned through Edward's file. What? He's an Aries, the total opposite of me. How could he be the one? As I walked away, I couldn't stop thinking. His rising moon sign must be Pisces or Cancer, or maybe something that matched mine. It was impossible to know for sure without knowing the exact time he was born. They should really make adding it to documents a legal requirement, as it's important. I was so lost in my thoughts that I bumped straight into someone. I looked up and mumbled out a sorry, Oh my days, it was... Edward, this was it. Our paths had crossed. Soon he'd invite me for a walk across the beach. Then we'd kiss under the moonlight. Hey, are you okay? He stared at me, but I was too busy fantasizing to focus. I think I may have been drooling a bit. So he put his hands on my shoulders and started shaking me. Hey, you're okay, right? I finally snapped out of it, blushed, and muttered out, Yeah, I'm fine. I know I'm a pretty girl. Hey, us Pisces have a natural born charisma. Plus, I was having this blushing look on. How can any boy resist this cutie? So I wasn't all that surprised when Edward said, Good, you had me worried there for a minute. Um, I'm new here and don't really know anyone. He itched at his neck. So, do you want to go grab a coffee after school? Besides, it'll be my way of apologizing for not looking where I was going. I gave my sweetest smile and said, Sure. We arranged to meet at this nearby coffee house. I know I told you I'm a quiet person, but surprisingly, Edward and I just clicked. We shared a muffin and he told me meeting me had been the best part of his day. He even asked for my number before I went home. Yay! Oh, I also found out what time he was born. I rushed home so I could look up his star sign, and as I expected, his moon and rising sun is Cancer, a total match with me. From that day on, we started texting and calling loads and even saw each other every day. It was great! Until one day, he asked me if I wanted to be his girlfriend. Oh my god, of course I wanted to! Everything was going exactly as I imagined it, but that's when it also started to get messy. Okay. So my horoscope obsession means I talk about stars, planets, the moon, the sun, and the personalities of each zodiac a lot. I know this drives him bonkers, as he's such a skeptic. One day in his horoscope, it was written that he should take it easy today and avoid strenuous exercise. But Edward had an important basketball match at school. I begged him not to participate, but he wouldn't listen. He said it was absurd. The team needed him and he couldn't let them down on a whim. I was frantic with worry that he was going to break his leg or something. I couldn't let this happen, so I put some laxative syrup in his water bottle. A few spoonsful would be enough, right? But I think I may have poured a little too much as he disappeared into the restroom for hours. Oops, the team lost. But at least my boyfriend didn't have any broken bones, right? That's not all. It was vital to me that he made all sorts of romantic gestures, just like they did in the Korean dramas that I love. So I made him stand outside my house in the middle of the night, then call me to tell me to go by the window so he could see me because he missed me so much that he needed to see my face. This was so romantic, especially when it rained. Nothing's hotter than your boyfriend standing under the rain in front of your house. Although I thought it was totally normal, Edward didn't think so. He thought I was insane, and he ended up with a cold afterward. Then one morning, I checked our horoscopes and I stared at my phone screen in shock. We were gonna break up, and that's when I got a message from him. We need to talk. Meet you after school. Oh Jesus, this wasn't a good sign. Did he really want to end things between us? All day long, I played out different scenarios of us breaking up in my head. Talk about torture. By the time school ended, I just wanted to get this over with, then go home and cry into my pillow. Edward was super quiet. He couldn't even meet my eyes, and the look on his face was so serious. I thought to myself, oh no, this is really happening? 
Our breakup was inevitable, but that didn't mean he got to do it. Yeah, that's right. So as soon as he began to talk, I butted in and said, I'm sorry, Edward, but we need to break up. Edward looked confused. At first, he thought I was playing out one of the romantic scenes again. But then when he realized I wasn't, he asked why and I replied, because our horoscope said so. Angrily, he replied, Alice, I was going to introduce you to my parents tonight because I love you. Uh, what? He wanted me to meet his parents and take our relationship to the next level? Stammering, I quickly tried to correct myself, but he didn't listen. You trust some garbage from the internet more than your own boyfriend. I am who I am, but you're just too selfish to accept it. And also, you love the person you created in your fantasy, not me. So, I think we should end it here. It's for the best. Then he left me standing there alone in floods of tears. I couldn't stop thinking about Edward and how devastated he looked. Did I misread the horoscopes? Or maybe they were wrong? I love him and he loved me too. We were meant to be, right? Suddenly, I knew exactly what I needed to do. So the next evening, I went around to Edward's house. He answered the door and gave me a confused look. Alice, what are you doing here? I messed up and I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. He snorted. Is that so? What about if your horoscope tells you different tomorrow? Then what? It doesn't matter. I shook my head. I'm willing to make some changes. Why do you think I'm here? I'm ready to take the next step in our relationship and meet your family. I held a box of chocolates up. Does your mom like chocolates? At first, he was silent, but then he smiled and pulled me in for a hug. Yes, Alice, my mom loves chocolates, but I love you more. Phew. So, I got my boyfriend back and also met his family, who turns out are super nice. I try not to mention horoscopes too much, but I may have asked his sweet mom if she's a Libran. Yep, she is. I knew it. As for now, I'm still reading my horoscopes, but I'm not taking them quite as literal anymore. I've learned that the stars tell the possibility, not the truth. At the end of the day, everything that happens to me is based on my own decisions and actions, nothing else. Hey, horoscopes led me to find Edward, but they also almost caused me to lose him forever. And there's no way I'm making that mistake ever again. Okay, Cupcake, say ah. Ah. Ugh. Were they actually feeding each other? Seriously? How was I meant to concentrate on the movie with them doing that? Ugh, gross. Annoyed, I stood up, tipped my bucket of popcorn on their heads, then walked off. Don't panic. I'm not a crazy person. They weren't some random couple. Nope. I know them. The girl Shelly, she's my best friend. For as long as I can remember, it was just me and her. Best friends against the world. But then one day, this guy Leon showed up out of nowhere, and boom, they started dating. Do you know what the worst thing was? This Leon guy was two years younger than me. He was so immature, seriously. Every time I made plans with Shelly, he tagged along too. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was Shelly. I rolled my eyes as I answered, knowing she'd be furious. Peter, how could you? I keep finding popcorn in my hair. It's gross. You're so childish. Yeah, yeah, whatever. She was the one who turned me into a third wheel for our scheduled movie night. I ended the call. I was done talking to her. That's when I saw the news article pop up on my phone. There was a weather warning for a freak magnetic storm. It was advising everyone to stay at home and turn all technological devices off. Well, that was fine by me. It's not like I wanted to stay out anymore anyway. So I went home and went straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up and, huh? Why was my dad sitting at the end of my bed? I rubbed my eyes and asked him what was up. He seemed lost in thought, but then he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Nothing, son. If you feel like you want to talk, I'm here for you. I understand. Then he left my room. Huh? What was that all about? I went downstairs for breakfast. That's when I heard my granny say, I will prove to you guys that he's not. Then I heard dad say, Mother, it's no big deal. Even if it's true, he's still our Peter. 
But when I walked into the kitchen, they all fell silent and gawped at me. I said, um, hey, you guys, what's the topic? Then my mom replied while passing me a plate of pancakes. Nothing, son. Even my younger sister, Lena, was acting strange. She gave me this weird smile, then shook her head. Okay, this was odd, but I just shrugged it off and ate my breakfast. Afterward, Mom asked me to help her out in the rock garden. Yeah, sure, I mean, it's not like I had anything better to do. Now, let me tell you, those rocks are way heavier than they look. As I struggled to carry one, I puffed out to Mom, Where do you want this? It's so heavy. Can you call out Dad to help? Shaking her head, she said, No, you can do it. You're not a weak boy. Then she continued to direct me to carry the pile of rocks all over the garden. I carried on until I had jelly arms and couldn't manage it anymore. I told Mom I needed to take a break and began to head inside. She shouted after me, No, you can do it by yourself. You're a big, strong boy. I didn't get it. Why couldn't she see that I was exhausted? That's when I spotted Shelly peering at me over the fence. She smiled and waved me over. Hang on. Wasn't she still in a mood with me? So what had changed? Whatever. I needed to escape mom, so I went over to her. She apologized for yesterday, then asked me if I wanted to go shopping. I agreed. Anything to get me out of lugging more rocks about. As I walked over to Shelly's car, I spotted my neighbor standing outside of his house. I smiled over at him, but he gave me this odd look, then started giggling. I quickly looked down at my pants. Nope, I hadn't forgotten to do my zip up, so why was he laughing at me? I was thinking about how weird everyone was being as I got into the car. Then I thought out loud, maybe it's the storm? It sent everyone bonkers. Then I told Shelly about all of the crazy things that had been going on. She nodded and said, yeah, it must be down to the storm. Hmm, well, it didn't make sense, because I'd read about magnetic storms and how they could impact people's moods and stuff. At the mall, we went into a shop, and I helped her choose some clothes to try on. I picked up a purple dress and told her it was a lovely color, when suddenly my granny jumped up out of nowhere and said, No, you don't love it. Follow me. I'll get you some new clothes. Then, before I could work out what was going on, she was pulling me out of the shop. I was so confused. Granny, why are you here? Did you follow me? She smiled up at me and replied, Peter, darling, don't blame me for wanting the best for you. Huh? This was strange, but okay. I was about to get new clothes, so I didn't think I needed to question more about it. We ended up in this vintage shop, and I felt like I'd stepped into a time loop. All the items were from the 80s or even older. She started grabbing items off the rails and saying things like, Ooh, I like this one. And you'll look very handsome in this. This wasn't my style, but Granny looked so excited, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings. So yeah, I ended up trying the clothes on. I looked ridiculous. Granny seemed delighted. She gasped, clapped, and exclaimed, Oh my, you're such a handsome boy, while Shelly was trying her hardest not to laugh. After that, we all went home, and yep, I was wearing the funny outfit. Everyone was pointing and laughing at me, but Granny seemed oblivious to this. She just smiled and said, All the girls will fall for you now. <laughs> yeah, right. I doubt it. Later on, I was in my room minding my own business when my phone beeped. Hey, I go to the same college as you. I saw you yesterday and I like your style. Do you want to hang out sometime? Lily, X. Huh? Was this someone's idea of a joke? I didn't know this number, nor this Lily girl. What was going on? The magnetic storm had sent everyone loopy, and I seemed the only sane one left. I immediately texted back that I wasn't interested, but geez, this girl was stubborn and she wouldn't stop messaging me. Over the next few days, Granny's bizarre behavior continued. It was stressing me out. She kept giving odd looks in my direction and muttering stuff to mom about me. But then one time she actually followed me when I was on my way to the shop and asked me why I wasn't in the outfit she'd bought for me. When I told her it was in the wash, she looked upset, shook her head, and mumbled out something about how I'd never find a nice young lady in my scruffy clothes. I tried messaging Shelly about it, but you guessed it, she was too busy with Leon to talk. So, in my loneliness, I turned to Lily. She was really sweet and said that my granny was probably just having an old people crisis. 
as the same thing happened with her gram, and that we should meet in the park and discuss it. I agreed to meet her, and while I was waiting for her to show up, this guy with movie star looks walked over. At first, I thought he was going to ask me for directions or something, but then he said in a flirty voice, Hey, you're on time. Then before I could say anything, he continued, It's me, Lily. Um, what was going on? This was insane. I asked him, Okay, so what game are you playing at? He looked confused and shook his head and said, I just want to hang out with you. Then he came closer to me and leaned on my shoulder. I pushed him away and stepped back. Oh no, I'm not gay. He frowned at me then shouted out, What? You are. Everyone knows that you are. I stood there feeling puzzled when who should show up but my sister Lena. I asked her, What the hell are you doing here? With a Cheshire cat grin on her face, she said, Just testing out if you're gay or not. And I have the answer. You're not. Now I'll have to tell mom and granny. Then she pulled out her phone. I grabbed her hand and said, Hold on. What? Gay? Who said that? What's going on? I'm talking about the rumor. A couple of days ago, the neighbor told mom that you're gay. Dad was cool about it, but mom and granny didn't take it well. Anyway, I told them I'd find out for sure. At first, I thought you were because you weren't interested in Lily, but now... She looked at the guy. My friend Robbie confirmed you're not. Okay, this was crazy. But where did this rumor come from? I asked my sister and she replied, Oh, they heard it from Leon. Leon? Hmm. This was suspicious. So I went over to Shelley's for answers. As soon as she opened the door, I rose my eyebrow and asked her, So, Shelley, everyone thinks I'm gay and apparently it's down to something Leon said. Would you happen to know anything about this? She blushed. Peter, I'm sorry. Leon was so jealous of you that I ended up telling him you were gay, just so he'd be cool with us hanging out. I gritted my teeth in anger, then yelled, I can't believe you ruined our friendship over that guy. So you'd rather spread wrong rumors about me than put some actual sense into your ridiculous boyfriend's head? You're so selfish. Well then, go live happily ever after with him as you wish. I'll stay out of your way. Then I hurried off. Later, she tried to call me, but I just turned off my phone. The next morning, I woke up and checked my social media to see a notification from Shelly pop right up. She had written a long post to tell everyone the truth and to apologize to me. Perplexed, I came downstairs to grab breakfast while considering if I should forgive her. Then I saw sitting in the living room was Shelly. Mom said she'd come over since early morning to apologize to me and my family. Come, dear, she knows what she did wrong, Mom whispered to me before leaving us two alone. Shelly came right up to me. Peter, I'm really sorry for being a jerk. You're my best friend, and Leon will just have to like it or lump it. I can get another boyfriend, but I never want to lose a friend like you. She spread out her arms. I hesitated. Then we eventually hugged it out. So, Shelly and I are best friends again. My family, well, they're back to normal levels of craziness. Yeah, it wasn't cool of Shelly to start a rumor about me, but so what if it turned out I was gay? I've told Granny and Mom this. I guess they're both just old-fashioned and need to get with the times a bit more, and realize that it doesn't matter if I like girls or boys, as either way, I'm still me, their same old Peter. At the end of the day, yup, I'm that guy who thought that the magnetic storm turned everyone crazy. One thing's for sure, Shelly will never let me forget this. So, the data needs to be collected by Friday so we can... I lowered my head and stuffed a pretzel into my mouth. Danny, are you eating? My boss glared back at me. I wiped my mouth onto the back of my hand and with cheeks full of food muffled out. No, no, of course not. It turns out my eagerness to eat a delicious, salty, crunchy pretzel during a work meeting, I'd forgotten to turn my microphone off. Oops. Hey, so I'm Danny. And I'm in love. With food. Why, you ask? Well, food's the one thing that's always been there for me. Through the good times and the bad, it's never let me down. All it takes is a hamburger with extra cheese 
and a salted caramel cheesecake, and I'm a happy girl. Gee, I'm salivating just thinking about it. But then my love of food almost cost me everything. Here's how. So after the pretzel incident, my boss fired me. Harsh. I know. This left me with no job, and as a result, no money to buy tasty snacks. What a bummer. One night, I was lounging on the couch, watching a movie and daydreaming about eating a triple chocolate sundae, when Jake, my boyfriend, sat down next to me with a huge bowl of candy and started telling me about his work colleague's birthday party. Ooh, candy. I grabbed a handful and started shoveling it into my mouth. Thanks, Jake. He knew the way to my heart. In between munching, I asked him, Can you bring a plus one? I want to go with you. Please? He shrugged and said, Sure. I clapped my sticky hands together. Ooh, a party! This was so exciting, as parties meant there'd be food and lots of it. As soon as we arrived there, I made a beeline for the buffet table. OMG! This was amazing. There were club sandwiches, mini pizzas, and potato salad bowls. I lifted the entire serving bowl up and started spooning the food into my mouth. Then some woman appeared next to me, frowning. She said, Um, excuse me, please, can you not eat out of the serving bowl? With my mouth full, I replied, Oh, sorry, it it tastes so good. Then I placed the bowl back down and grabbed a handful of potato chips. As she walked away, I heard her mutter under her breath, What a greedy guts. Eventually, Jake grabbed my arm and led me out of there. He was sulking and could barely meet my eye. So I asked him what was up. What's up? He grunted. Do you even need to ask? You sit around all day eating everything out of the cupboards. Then when I bring you along to my colleague's party, you hog the buffet? It was so embarrassing. This bummed me out. Um, I guess maybe I could have a little more self-control around party food. And I guess I did need to find a job. Besides, having money meant I could buy better snacks, and I wouldn't have to keep on taking Jake's. So I got a part-time job at my local cinema, on the popcorn counter. Mmm, that sweet, buttery popcorn smell. How I adored it. I couldn't help it. It was there staring at me, in all of its warm, golden stickiness. So in between serving a customer, I sneakily stuffed some into my mouth. What are you doing? My heart stopped as I heard a familiar voice behind me. I turned around and came face to face with my manager. I denied immediately. I I wasn't doing anything. As popcorn popping out of my mouth, they shouted at me and accused me of eating all the profits. So unfair. So you guessed it, I was fired. Again. I arrived home early with a tear-stained face and a bag full of my favorite chocolate treats to cheer me up. Jake looked over at me from the couch and asked me what was up. I slumped down next to him, pulled the wrapper off a chalk bar, and said, I got fired again. I couldn't help it. It, It's popcorn. It's too tasty. Does this world need to be so cruel? Then I took a bite out of the chocolate. Mmm, delicious. Jake shook his head, then sighing, said, Danny, admit it. It's your gluttony that gets you into trouble. So what? I enjoy eating, that's all. It doesn't hurt anyone. I finished the chalk bar and started unwrapping the next one. Jake shook his head, then walked off. Whatever. I didn't need his support, as I had delicious chocolate to comfort me. Yum. One day, like every other day, I searched the house for snacks. But nope, there weren't any anymore. I didn't have any money, so I couldn't go to the shop. So instead, I went on my phone and searched mukbang videos to kill some time. As I watched two girls stuff their mouths full of french fries dipped in a strawberry shake, I had an idea. Of course! Why hadn't I thought of this earlier? I should become a mukbanger. I'd get to earn money while doing what I love. Eating food. It was a win-win. For my first video, I kept it simple. It was just me in a white t-shirt, my phone as a camera, and a huge bowl of spaghetti. Crazily. People watched it and began following me. After a couple of videos, my popularity increased and my viewers started donating food and money to me. It was totally nuts. But with these things came the video requests, such as eat three tubs of fried chicken and ten plates of fried rice covered in mayo. Eating all this food did get kind of challenging. 
Once I was halfway through a hamburger eating video when I got a stitch in my stomach and had to stop. I so shouldn't have eaten pancakes for breakfast earlier. My fans were bummed out that I stopped the challenge and I felt really bad. I figured that if I was going to make this my job, then I'd have to start fasting beforehand so I could be at my best for the videos. Gee, this was hard work. One time I was so hungry, I went into the fridge and sniffed the cheese. But then when I finished a challenge, I felt so full and bloated that I resembled a puffer fish. Then there was the tiredness. I was so exhausted. I fell asleep on the bus to the supermarket and ended up in some weird town miles away. I had to ring Jacob to come and pick me up and he grumbled about it for the whole way back. Regardless of this, I carried on with the videos. But then one day a fan challenged me to the biggie, the fire noodle challenge. If you don't know what this is, then basically it involves a massive bowl full of the spiciest noodles ever. I took a mouthful of the noodles and OMG, I couldn't feel my tongue or face. My nose was running and I had to stick my tongue out to check if it was still there. This was just too much. There's no way I could endure any more of this. So I switched the bowl for non-spicy noodles and pretended I was eating the hot ones. Afterward, I edited the video and hey, I think I did a great job of faking it. Even though I'd only had one mouthful of the spicy stuff, it was repeating on me. My stomach gurgled and my tongue still felt numb. I lay on the couch with the hot water bottle pressed to my stomach and feeling sorry for myself, Jake sat down next to me and gave me a concerned look. Danny, you gotta stop this video thing and get a real job. With my swollen tongue, I managed to sputter out, Eating on videos is a real job. Jake shook his head. Gluttony is not a hobby. Everyone's just laughing at you. Um, hello. I was being paid for eating. And these videos help many lonely people out there to have company during a meal. They were laughing with me, not at me. Jeez, Jake was so boring at times. Between the spicy noodle challenge and some weird bug eating challenge in which I used jelly worms covered in chocolate instead of the real deal, faking became the norm for me. Soon the articles started circulating saying I was a fake eater. Posts such as, she's faking all the time? And no wonder she's still in shape popped up everywhere. After that, I had no choice but to live stream eat. Lots of my fans encouraged this, but it was hard work. It didn't take long for the weight to pile on, and within a month, I was up two dress sizes, and I felt super sluggish. One morning when Jake saw me searching my wardrobe for something, anything to wear that would fit me, he suggested we go jogging. I stared down at my favorite jeans that I now couldn't get past my thighs, and agreed to go. I had made it to the end of the block, and whoa, it was hot, and ugh, I couldn't breathe. I was crouched over, clutching a fence for support when a pregnant woman walked by. You're such an inspiration. Running at your age and after giving birth, even without this one, she clutched her bump, I wouldn't be able to manage it. What? Did she think I'd just had a baby and I was old? Oh, great. And now Jake burst out laughing too. I felt terrible. Did I really look that bad? This lingered in my mind, so I ended up going online and ordering some weight loss pills. I started taking them, and within a week, I had breakouts, stinky breath, awful wind, and I felt like a slug. Then one time I was in the kitchen taking the pills when Jake walked in, saw what I was doing, snatched them out of my hand, and said, Danny, look at you. You're a mess. You have to stop the pills and stop the videos. I was angrier than a nest of disturbed wasps, so I snatched the pills off him and kicked him out of the room. Then I yelled, You don't get it! Just leave me alone! Jake didn't say much to me after that, and I carried on with my mukbang bubble. Soon I hit 100,000 subscribers, and to celebrate, I went live with the table packed full of my favorite foods, fried chicken, pizza, donuts, and so on. I was stuffing my face when I felt so hot and sticky the room began to spin. I slurred out, I, I don't feel so good. Then I fainted in the middle of a live stream. I woke up a few hours later in the hospital with a drip in my arm and a serious-faced doctor glaring down at me. They told me that I had high cholesterol 
and if I carried on like this, I'd end up with diabetes and stomach bleeding. Well, that was it. I burst into tears and vowed that I would make some big changes. I love eating. That will never change. But I just can't do the mukbang videos anymore. Now, I still enjoy food, but I don't overindulge anymore. Oh, I also have a new job working in a restaurant, and amazingly, I've managed to resist eating all of the tasty-looking food. I'm on the way to becoming the cute, confident version of myself again. And from now on, if I'm happy, sad, or whatever, well, I talk to Jake about it, instead of turning to food. I will always love food, but I guess I eventually figured out that I love my health and Jake even more. Shh, don't tell him that. It'll give him a big head. Hi, everyone. Have you ever had someone get revenge on you? It's not fun, right? Well, this is my story about revenge, but with a twist. You won't believe who my prankster turned out to be. Oh, let me introduce myself. I'm Audrey, and I'm 24. To say I've had an unhappy life would be an understatement. Firstly, my dad ditched my mom for another woman. And not long after that, my mom passed away from a serious illness. Basically, my entire life fell apart in a matter of months, and I was still too young at that time. It was tough growing up, and I always think that my life could never turn the page again. But on one fine day, someone popped into my life and changed everything. His name was Jim, and he was seven years older than me. And he seriously turned my life around. He lived in another city, but he often came to my city on business trips. We fell for each other quickly. That happiness didn't last long, though. One day I was working in the clothes store when a girl around the same age as me came in. She wanted my help to choose some dress, but she was pretty rude to me and I kept catching her staring at me with evil eyes. Who was she? And why was she treating me like that? Finally, after about two hours, she made up her mind and picked up only a tie that she wanted to buy for her husband instead. I was relieved to get rid of her, but shocked when I saw the name on her credit card. Jim Stewart. Her husband had the exact same name as my boyfriend. What a coincidence. She must have caught me staring at the card because she suddenly said, Yes, Jim is my husband. Now stay away from him. What? Her husband? My Jim. Before I even had a chance to react, she turned to everyone in the store and said, This girl is a gold digger, and she's trying to break up my marriage. I was shocked. I tried to explain that it wasn't true, but she wouldn't listen to me. She just stormed out, and I was left standing there hearing people whispering about me. It was the most humiliating moment of my life. I immediately ran to the staff room and called Jim. I was really hoping it had all been a big misunderstanding, but I could tell from Jim's tone that it was the truth. He told me he'd lied to me, and that he actually lived in the same city. He just made up the business trip stuff so he wouldn't have to see me often. Then he said, Audrey, I honestly love you. I'm serious about us. Hang on, was he for real? It was ridiculous. I was disgusted by him. How could he treat me like that? I hung up and felt horrified. It brought back horrible memories of the woman who stole my dad away from my mom. I didn't want to be that woman. The next day, I moved out of the house Jim had rented for me. I didn't want to be associated with that loser anymore, but life works in mysterious ways. The day I moved into my new house, I saw Jim's wife. And you won't believe it. It seemed that she just moved in next door too. Was this some kind of joke? As soon as she saw me, she smirked and said, Wow, what a coincidence. Hello, neighbor. I'm Linda. Seeing her unpacking her stuff all by herself, I couldn't help but wonder where Jim was. But then I thought maybe Linda had ended things with him and had moved here alone. I hope so anyways. I'd hate to have Jim as a neighbor. So that's when my new life began. And it has been crazy ever since. From that first week of living there, Linda started pranking me. It all began with her throwing trash into my yard. I even caught her doing it and she just grinned and said, Oops, my hand slipped. Then she walked away laughing. It made me furious. And that was just the beginning. One weekend, a delivery guy rocked up on my porch with 10 extra large pizzas. I tried to explain I hadn't ordered them, and that's when Linda appeared at my door and said, Oh, thanks for ordering me dinner, Audrey. I'm starving. Then she grabbed five of the pizzas and ran to her house, leaving me there with a bill of $100.
Jeez, it was so annoying. And I had no option but to pay. Linda was too much. Seriously. As much as her pranks drove me up the wall, I also felt sorry for her. I knew what it was like to have someone you love stolen away from you. She must have hated me so much for ruining her marriage, even though it hadn't been my fault. I decided to just put up with her pranks. She'd get over it eventually, and it's not like they were harming me, right? Well, one night I heard the doorbell. I wasn't expecting anyone and was surprised to see a young guy standing there with a poster that said, I agree to be your boyfriend. Come out with me. I was totally puzzled and told him he had the wrong house, but then he showed me the address on the other side. It was my address. What on earth? I told him I wasn't interested, but he tried to grab my hand and said, Come on, girl, don't be shy. I told him if he didn't leave me alone, I'd call the police. So luckily he ran away. Needless to ask, I knew for sure that was Linda's joke. But this time she had taken it too far. I decided to go over and have a word with her once and for all. As I was walking to her house, I saw someone familiar on the other side of the road. I couldn't believe it. It was my dad? So many years had passed, and he'd completely changed. But there was no doubt it was him. I suddenly blurted out, Dad? But I didn't know what to do next. I was just thinking about my next move when I felt someone behind me. I turned around and saw Linda. She just smirked at me and walked away. What was her problem? Did she hear what I just said? I was so shocked at seeing my dad, I ran back into my house. I hated him for what he'd done to my mom. But he was still my dad, and I wanted to know if he was okay and what he was doing here. I barely slept that night as I couldn't stop thinking about my dad. The next morning, I was sitting by the window when he appeared again. This time, he was with Linda, and she was holding his arm. What was she doing with my dad? Why were they so close? Later that day, I saw him again, and this time, he and Linda were hugging. OMG, were they dating? Maybe Linda had heard me call him dad, and now she was flirting with him to truly get revenge on me. This was too much. The thought of Linda as a stepmom made me want to puke. I waited and waited, but he was inside her house and there was no sign of him leaving. Eventually he left and as soon as he was in his car, I ran over to her house. I was shaking as I knocked on the door and as Linda opened it, I said, You are way too much. Can you just stop with the revenge already? Linda looked confused and said, What the heck are you talking about? Linda still didn't seem to get it. And I was about to explain when I heard footsteps. I turned around and my dad was right there. He said, What's the matter, Linda? Why are you fighting with this stranger? Huh? Stranger? Didn't he recognize me? Then Linda butted in and said, It's okay, Dad. We're just having a misunderstanding here. What? Dad? Is he your dad? Really? I stammered. Yeah, why? What's the matter? He said, Linda, you don't need to lie to me. I know you're dating my dad to get revenge on me. I continued. Whoa, hold on. What do you mean your dad? Linda gasped. At that, my dad looked confused too and walked to me and asked if he could look at my hand. After seeing my birthmark, he started crying and hugging me. Audrey, it's you. It's really you. I didn't know how to react, so I just let him hug me. It had been so long since anyone had held me like this. Ever since my mom had died, I'd tried to be strong and keep it together, but suddenly I couldn't hold back anymore. I burst into tears in his arms. We stood like that for a long time, and eventually he took me into Linda's house and told me the story. It turned out, after he left me and my mom, he got tricked by that woman, and he was so ashamed, he decided to move to another city and start over. He was working hard on a construction site one day when he got injured, so he ended up in hospital. And that's when he met Linda. She'd been in a car accident and needed a blood transfusion urgently. She has a pretty rare blood type, but luckily my dad had the same type and he volunteered to give her a transfusion. After that, they became quite close, and seeing as Linda had lost both her parents in the car accident, my dad eventually adopted her. I couldn't believe it. My dad had been through so much, and this whole time, I thought he was off living his life with a rich woman. I felt so bad for him and decided to leave the past behind and forgive him. As for Linda, she was also left confused by this coincidence, so she left the room to process everything, while I and Dad took time to catch up on our lives. Later, Linda prepared dinner for us three, and before we digged in, she shyly grabbed my hand and said, Audrey, I've been so awful to you. I'm sorry. I know you aren't the one responsible for my divorce, but I still felt upset, and that's why I played all those pranks. That was so childish, right? Please forgive me. 
sister. We laughed it off, then hugged each other to make peace. I couldn't believe it. After all these years of being lonely, suddenly I had a sister, and my dad was back. My life had finally turned a corner, and I almost laughed at the thought that it was all because of meeting Jim. At least one good thing had come out of that disastrous relationship.